Welcome back, everyone, and um, welcome to those of you here in the audience, and also welcome to those of you who are watching over the live stream. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying the discussion, and um, we hope you're also sharing your thoughts. And let me um, give you the, uh, the Twitter uh, hashtag without flubbing it this time. It's hashtag LABC Summit 2018, so please keep tweeting. So, uh, our last panel explored creating a regionalized energy market, which could reap rewards in terms of energy efficiency and, and job creation. Now we're gonna focus on the state level with our next panel, which is titled Achieving California's Climate Change and Clean Energy Goals. Moderator Jake Levine will guide a discussion on how top state regulators, utilities, and businesses are planning to meet 2030 state mandate targets and if California should move toward 100% renewable energy. Please welcome to the stage panel number three. I think there's a panel coming behind me. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Um, I'm super excited. I think, let's see how we can all get into our seats. This is me and this is you. Um, so we were talking backstage we realized that this is the dream team of clean energy thinkers in California and potentially around the world. So I think we're in for a real treat here. Um, and we have quite a broad topic and a lot to get through. So we're gonna, we're gonna just dive right in. Um, you know, I think that California has set out nationally leading targets on emissions reductions, renewables with SB 350, SB 32 in addition to nationally leading models around how to achieve those targets with equity in mind. Um, and so as we reach uh, for these goals and as we do so in an equitable, equitable way, we're curious to know how that's gonna get done. And this panel is really leading almost every aspect of that discussion. Um, it's actually quite impressive. So I think that, um, what we'd like to do is start things off with Richard Mullen, who's to my left, um, the first chair ever of the California Energy Commission, um, uh, currently serving on the ISO Board of Governors. And we just heard a long discussion prior to this panel about how our neighbors to the north in Oregon and Washington, um, how local and state jurisdictions are thinking about a sort of a Western grid, a set of Western policy priorities, um, and we wanted to get the ISO view on this issue of regionalization, which has taken center stage in Sacramento and sort of among this community of policy thinkers, and I'll just hand it over to Richard here to, to sort of walk us through that a little bit. Well, I'm going to bounce it back to you because you had a great idea. Why don't we take a, a sound of hands? How many understand what regionalization is or what, it, what you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> There's a scattering over in the, in the in the far left, both politically and, and logistically here today. <laughs> There's some um, centrist who raised their hand. I didn't see this uh, over here. Maybe the voters on the right would. Uh, well, anyway, the, the, this is the little idea. Of, there's a lot of conversation about regionalization, without too, too many people knowing basically what its, its fundamental idea is. It is to establish a regional grid that um, covers most of the, the um, utility centers in, in uh, the uh, western United States. When we say establish a, a, a unified grid, we're talking about having one central operator uh, who, will, who will deal with um, the, the demand and supply of, of electricity. Um, on behalf of, of, of all the people who participate in the in the regionalized uh, electric grid uh, proposition, it's a, a, a break from um, what we have today, where there are many bilateral uh, agreements, and uh, there's a sort of a, a chance for people to um, gain some advantage one versus another in the execution of contracts. But really what is, what is sought out is, is a, a system which 
runs a market with um, energy that's supplied by the regional uh, attributes of the of the um, area which is being served. It means um, that the there will be, that uh, there, there will be uh, cooperation and uh, sort of a unified point of view where the the goal of, of um, obtaining the, the benefits of uh, shared uh, resources is uh, at hand and, and capable of being played out. It um, doesn't mean necessarily that um, one or another of the, of the state areas that would uh, participate in the in the regionalized market um, would have any advantage over anybody else. This has been a concern that we we hear as we walk the halls of the uh, California legislature seeking support for what uh, to some people is the obvious. Uh, if California is generating um, a lot of electricity through its solar power uh, installations and um, to the point where uh, there's, there's not enough market in California just by itself to absorb that energy. It would make, make sense to offer that energy to other regions, other players, uh, to, um, so that, that uh, we're, we're not having the, sort of the absurd situation where um, plants, power, electric power plants, solar and uh, wind that have been developed to, to uh, avoid uh, the addition of more greenhouse gases and, and also to uh, reduce the, uh, the greenhouse gas production that, that we, we have today. The, the, the idea is that um, if there's a resource that is clean and, and, uh, and, and underutilized, that it, be, it can be obtained uh, as an as a energy supply um, through the, the single market that, uh, that offers the best chances for the, an economic and, and greenhouse gas low um, offering of, of, of electric power. And it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated uh, in, in part because Many people don't want to uh, give up the existing systems that they have now. They, they work well enough, they say, and uh, they're not um, anxious for uh, change. Uh, but in fact, uh, it makes sense for there to be change in, in uh, how uh, the, the markets in, in various parts of the West are run. A single market would uh, offer the, the best, best economic opportunities for the, the production of energy by California solar and a little bit of wind. With wind and, and solar in, in other parts of the, of the, the West where uh, the, it, the advantage is sort of an optimal um, use of the electricity rather than um, proceeding on just simply bilateral arrangements or uh, uh, ignoring the, the, the problem of uh, excess capacity at certain times of the year, ignoring that uh, and doing nothing about it. So uh, we would like to think that the, the regional energy market that uh, could be developed in, in uh, the western U.S. would be a, a, an advantage for um, California as well as Every other state that's in the discussion range, uh, the two northwest states we've heard from today, um, and the Nevada, Arizona, uh, Utah, Idaho, uh, other states that uh, could join into the uh, into a, a single regional market. I'm, I'm going to stop here because there's going to be many questions by the remainder of the panel. So that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, primer um, on an incredibly complex issue. And for the panel, if you, um, you know, we're going to dive into lots of subjects, but 
Um, this is like white elephant. Like once something's on the board, if you want to come back and, and revisit it, feel free. Um, <laughs> so, um, Ron, I, I thought we'd go to you next. Um, you are the president of um, SoCal Edison, one of the largest IOUs um, in the country. Um, in November of last year, Edison released its Pathway to 2030, which lays out a number of goals around how Edison and, uh, frankly, the state can reach some of these uh, policy targets that we've discussed, um, including a call for 80% carbon-free energy, 7 million electric vehicles. Um, it's been six months since you published that report. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're done. <laughs> it's all taken care of. No, thanks, Jake. You know, we, uh, some people thought we were a little presumptuous as one utility in California to do an assessment of what we thought all of California, not just the utilities, but other sectors of the economy need to do to be able to meet our 2030 uh, goals for, uh, for getting uh, to 40 percent below 1990 levels of, of greenhouse gas emissions by, by 2030, the 1990 levels. And we really wanted to look at this from a perspective of how can we, how can we get there on a, on a basis that's affordable for everyone. You might have heard, a, if you were here this morning, in a conversation that indicated, I think it was Dave Wright from LADWP was talking about uh, how do we get to, uh, you know, how do we get to these when, when power supply is a much smaller piece of, of greenhouse gas emissions? And it is. It's less than 20 percent today all of the state. On the naturals, we move forward by 2030, we'll, it'll be single, single digit percentage of the total carbon. So we're comfortable that, that we can get to that, that 80 percent carbon free. That does include hydro, existing hydroelectric, by the way. Last I knew hydroelectric was carbon free. And it's important to recognize that because it is about the carbon. It is about getting that GHG down. We've got, we've, we've got to make some significant moves, though, outside of that. And, you know, the, the governor came up with his plan for 5 million, or at least a, a target of, of 5 million uh, electric vehicles by, uh, by 2030. And we said, that's a, that, that's a good start. We think it needs to be a couple million more. And how do we get there? I mean, one of the things that we need to do is obviously is, frankly, be able to educate people about electric vehicles. Because how many people here either have or are seriously considering buying <clears throat> some form of a, a battery or a PHEV vehicle? Okay, it's pretty good. Well, we're talking when you get to, if you get to 7 million, that's about roughly about a quarter of all autos by 2030. <clears throat> that would be, that would be electric. So that's a, actually a little bit more than what I think I saw with the light in my eyes and what handed here. And this is a pretty enlightened audience, right? So we're going to be looking to, to educate people. Where when I went out and bought my, my, my first electric vehicle, I knew way more about it, the vehicle and everything, than the guy that was trying to sell it to me. And the show report. <laughs> that has to change. So education is a, really, is, is a really big part of that. And we also have to make certain that it isn't just a wealthy person's option, which today it is. And that has to change. We have, we have unfortunately, um, uh, uh, within the Southern California Edison service territory, our 15 million people, 5 million customers that, that, that we serve, using the state's disadvantaged community, and I don't like that term, I like to consider them underserved communities, but that's the state's term. Um, we have within our service territory 47 percent of the state's disadvantaged community. Now that's income as well as air quality, environmental, and other environmental issues. We have to find a way to get affordable opportunities for people irrespective of their income needs. And second, uh, second owner vehicles is a way. Getting some kind of incentives and opportunities uh, to, to make that happen has to happen if we're going to get close to that seven million. <clears throat> And on top of that, the other piece is not just vehicles, light vehicles. We, we have to move on, on medium and heavy duty trucks. And, you know, some, several hundred thousand to make that as part of our plan to get there. Now, we've done some great work collaborating with the Port of Long Beach. I know DWP is, has done the same with the Port of LA. 
And that's, you know, where the, the life blood of the economy, you know, $155 billion comes out of those ports yeah. into, uh, in, into uh, our economy. It's a lifeblood. But as you, if you live along those corridors, um, your life is a very different and degraded life compared to somebody who doesn't. We need to change that as well. So moving forward with plans, we've, we've uh, been approved tentatively, a proposed decision by the Public Utilities Commission, not as broad as we asked for, but approved ours and Pacific Gas and Electric's plans for uh, medium and heavy truck electrification plans going forward. So that's a, that's a great start. We're seeing uh, so many, almost, almost every couple of months, there's another global truck manufacturer. I'm not talking about just autos but truck manufacturer that's talking about coming out with, with either all electric or, or hybrid electric, electric trucks out there. Well, we need to make sure that we're doing this plan is to get ahead of that. We don't want to be where we are with cars and have a situation where, where the cars were coming out before we had an infrastructure to charge them. So that's, that's the plan overall on that. And the other is battery storage. That we're going to have 80% um, carbon-free energy by 2030 we're going to need on the order, we think, something like 10,000 megawatts of, of storage that's probably going to be battery storage. So for those of you, you know, we throw around numbers a lot. To put that in context, that's a little bit more than one and a half times the peak load of the entire city of Los Angeles in batteries. Um, that's a tall order. Edison, you know, in terms of what are we, how's that coming along? Edison is the, is the largest uh, mover on, on battery storage in the nation. We have about 400 megawatts that's either operating uh, or under contract, and the vast majority of that, by the way, is not owned by us. It's owned by third parties, some, some of it behind the meter. Uh, it's a great start, but Edison's share of that 10,000, our service territory is probably like 3,500 megawatts. So it's like eight times, eight to nine times uh, what, what uh, we have now that we have to get on board. That's a tall order, uh, a tall order as well. We think we can get there, we think it's important, and we think it's important that we do this in a manner that meets, uh, that, that works across all of our customers, irrespective of geography uh, or, or income level. Yeah, well, there's a lot to dig into there, and I'm excited that we have a couple panelists who can speak to some of those particular issues, um, especially on the storage front of Poly. But let's first go to um, Jason uh, Barrett, uh, who's Vice President for Structured Finance and Investments at GAF, um, doing a huge amount of uh, solar financing, uh, and particularly here in the LA Basin. Um, Jason, I, I wanted to get your take. There's been a lot of um, commotion at the federal level, uh, and particularly in your line of business. We've seen some tax reform. We've seen some tariffs. Um, give us the state of the of the solar finance market. Yeah, that's a very tall order to say. And, and uh, you know, if you guys have a hard time sleeping, I'm, I'm happy to, to come by your bedside and, and talk to you about that. <laughs> 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 but, but having said that, so, um, you know, uh, Jason Barrett, GAF, uh, we're the largest uh, roofing manufacturer in the world. And you could see, I always tell everyone, the opportunity for solar is that when you're landing, let's say you're landing in LA and you see all that roof space and you don't see any solar, there clearly is an opportunity there uh, to utilize, uh, you know, whether it be a commercial building or a residential build building. But to address your, your tax question, the solar business has been under, uh, under, under a lot of attack. And I'm not going to politicize anything, but there are certain people who believe that, uh, you know, the, the warming of the climate is a, is a, is a fable that came from uh, somewhere in Asia. Obviously, we don't believe that we would not be in this room. And so you had the ITC, the investment tax credit. Now, I'm going to walk you through something very briefly, and, and again, I'll, I'll be told to shut up soon. So let's think about how a deal is financed. That's very, very important. So you can understand why, why the, the implication of uh, the tax credit and the tax law change. So let's say you have a $100 project. That $100 project can be financed with something called tax equity, something called sponsor equity, and you can also finance it with debt. That's very, very important. Uh, Section 48 of, uh, of the tax code is something called the investment tax credit. And you get a 30% credit 
for uh, if you invest or you own a solar system. And what that means is when somebody says a credit, instead of you writing a check to the U.S. government, you can actually invest in one of these systems. So um, as GAF, we have a lot of tax capacity. And so what we're doing is we're, we're leading with our balance sheet by taking leadership. But instead of writing a check to the U.S. government, what we're doing is we're directing that capital into, uh, into solar deals. So at the end of, uh, it was in 2015, December, the tax credit was supposed to expire at the end of 2016. When I say expire, it was going to be reduced from 30%. Instead of getting a 30% tax credit, it was going to be 10%. That would have taken a lot of liquidity out of the market and make you know, certain deals untenable. So in December, the only time the, the, the Republicans and Democrats agreed on something, they actually extended the tax credit. Uh, through, uh, through 2000, 2022. So that was the first, I'd say, main, the first attack. The second attack you had was uh, the tariff. There was a recent tariff uh, on imported solar modules. Uh, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, there was a motion that was filed by Cineva and was filed by, uh, by, uh, by Solar World. And what happened was um, the pronouncement came out this year and there's going to be a 30% tariff. You have 2.5 gigawatts that are going to be ex exempt of imported uh, uh, solar modules. And then that tariff is going to drop down from 30% to 25%, and it, and, it, and it phases out over time. That was going to increase the cost of doing solar deals. So that could have had a deleterious effect on our market. And I'll tell you, we've survived that. And the other thing we had was tax reform. So when you look at a deal, the components of a deal are you have a tax credit, you get the depreciation associated with that asset, and you get the cash associated with that deal. So as it relates to tax reform, the corporate tax rate was reduced by 40%. It went from 35% to 21%. So what that means is the value of your depreciation went down. So in terms of the market and how the market responded, and just to give you a sense, the tax equity market is around a $10 billion market. There's $6 billion for wind. There's $4 billion for, uh, for solar. And so what you had was a lot of the tax equity investors were going to effectively move away from the space because it was no longer as attractive given the, the, the loss of the depreciation. I see you guys going to sleep already. <laughs> I, see I, knew, I knew it was going to happen. So, so I'm going to shut up soon. So, Fast forward. <laughs> I was at the BRC, the Business Renewable Center. I was here with, I think, my partner, Tony Rafine. So if you have any tough questions, you, you make sure you seek him out and you ask him. Where are you, Tony, by the way? Oh, he's somewhere. Okay, he's right. hiding. He's hiding. <laughs> there we go. But the long and short of it, I was at the BRC. It's, the, it's put on by the Rocky Mountain Institute. It's probably the permanent group for corporates who are focused on, on solar. And they had you know, record, uh, a record group of folks. If you don't have corporations who are focused on um, you know, reducing their carbon footprint, focused on you know, using solar, using wind, et cetera, the business dries up. So what I will tell you this is that if you're a developer and you're in the market, that the corporate market is thirsting for renewable energy. Because again, that's a bellwether conference. If people don't go there, and people aren't looking to do these third-party PPAs, et cetera, it's very, very, very difficult to do this stuff. So, you know, I'll summarize this by saying the market is here. We're going to survive. We survived the ITC extension. We survived tax reform. We survived the tariff. Um, it took a little bit of capital out of the market. Be before, I would invest 40% in a deal. Now I'm investing around 35% of the deal. The good news is that the bank market has now taken up that reduction in liquidity. Because, for example, last year you had, call it 50 to 60 banks that would lever these transactions. Now you have 70 to 90 banks that are levering these deals. So the liquidity that came out because of tax reform has now been taken up by the bank market. But more importantly, the corporates, when you go and you talk to the renewable, you know, the head of sustainability, the CFOs, the treasurers, people are beginning to realize that they want to go green. They want to reduce their carbon footprint. Without them, you know, from my standpoint, there would not be an investment. So the good news is I'm still here, very active, very eager. And we can talk about you know, some projects that we've done. We've done the largest solar roof in the world. It's in LA, I want to say that. We came in, financed that deal. It's equivalent to taking 6,000 cars off. So again, 
when you get more corporate or finance folks like myself who are coming into the space to provide liquidity, all of the, you know, the goals that California is trying to meet, obviously you need private capital to come in and support those efforts. Yeah, yeah and, and, and you know, I think we do see more, when you're landing at LAX, you actually do see more and more solar, um, particularly in areas that GAF has been invested in, particularly in areas where I see Mary Leslie over there, where uh, the feed-in tariff has been available to developers and investors. So thank you for being able to translate the finance speak and, and uh, power through um, the, bedtime, the bedtime stories on our behalf. Um, <laughs> Jake, I just want to add one. Yeah, one, please. One quick point on that, and that is, um, it's important that the financing works. It's important that we have the incentives right. In 2013, one percent, one percent of of Edison's power supply to our customers was from solar. Five years ago. Today, it's 15 percent, 15 times. By 2040, in that plan we laid out, we need to get 40 percent. Uh, and, that, and that's just the large-scale stuff. We need to go, today we have about 2,500 megawatts of rooftop solar from our customers. That probably needs to get to north of 8,000 megawatts by 20. So this has to, this model needs to continue to work. So a, a perfect transition to the, the world of distributed energy generation and energy storage. Um, uh, Polly Shaw, a VP for Regulatory Affairs and Communications at STEM. Um, Polly, STEM helps organizations to automate energy costs by utilizing tools like demand response, energy storage, behind the meter, um, probably some terms there that are worth explaining a little bit um, uh, as we dive in, but can you talk a little bit about how the role of distributed uh, energy resources comes into play into this broader discussion that we've been having? Sure, and let me try to pitch it for the storage uh, subject writ large as a climate solution. Um, STEM, just a quick second, is the leader in the customer-sided space, serving public and private uh, customers with behind-the-meter AI-driven energy storage systems. We've got about 860 systems that are either in pipeline or in place. Uh, in five U.S. states, now Japan and Ontario, Canada as well, and we're headquartered up the road uh, near the In-N-Out Burger near SFO. So, uh, writ large, backing up, storage is a fun and wonderful game-changing solution as we look at the climate toolbox, but it's going to provoke a lot of opportunity and a lot of complexity because we're moving from a binary world you had off or on, you had energy efficiency working or not, you had renewables producing or not. Now we're moving to a multiplicity paradigm because of the services that are offered by uh, energy storage in various ways where you can provide generation capacity, you can optimize T&D assets, you can provide ramping and uh, fast ramping and smoothing renewables, you can do frequency response and ancillary services, you can do on-site backup capacity, sometimes many of those within the space of 24 hours, very granular, very uh, sub-hourly, very flexibly, whether bulk or in a aggregation of customers sited into a network. And that is a wonderful climate solution. But it is going to be a bit challenging for folks, especially for policymakers who are trying to catch up to that world. Part of the game-changing nature of this is that storage is way more than about the commodity battery. It's all about the software, especially the artificial intelligence that some use behind the software. We call ours Athena. It's our brain that optimizes real-time energy optimization for a customer on-site, while also looking at the market opportunities that that site can be networked into, into a larger virtual power plant that provides additional services that give a customer new ways of participating in the market. So let me back up a little bit and talk about storage writ large in greenhouse gas solutions and then give a local example. Um, AB, excuse me, SP32, carb scoping plan, these are really ambitious goals. We've got to throw the kitchen sink at it. And all forms of storage, whether in anywhere on the, on the grid, are going to be useful to this at different times. So if you've got, you know, clearly the electricity sector, you've got storage as the enabling technology that allows you to integrate ever higher penetrations of renewables beyond 60% with the DERs that are coming on, uh, on the customer-sided premises. You've got building efficiency, trying to achieve SB350's doubling of building efficiency, 
using storage co-sited with DERs to get to zero or net zero. Transportation, that's going to be really interesting where there's a great partnership between storage and transportation because you're talking about the same granular, flexible network that is now needed in the electricity network, now transporting to tra the transportation sector, the digitization of some of that. So imagine if, an example, you've got three fast chargers on a rest stop that had very small load. Think about what that's about to do to the load shape and the energy bills there. You've got a great opportunity to pull in storage and be able to match that and then enable that site to then participate into grid services contracts or other types of contracts to value stack and make it way more cost effective for rate payers. So <clears throat> what we do, um, great example, bring it home to LA. We have what we are building, Navigant Consultant Posits could be the largest virtual power plant in the world. It's an 85 megawatt local capacity requirement contract for Southern California Edison, providing flexible capacity year round, uh, real time, day ahead basis, where and when it's needed by Edison. What we do is we work with the CI customer or public institution to address their demand charge uh, management. And, and bring down their costs on a subscription service. And then, as I said, we network it with all of our other projects, and we use some of it for, say, the LCR contract when needed, when called, or um, we may build um, a, a additional systems for other uses, which I'll explain. Um, Edison gets a flexible capacity resource when and where it's needed, and then they also get customer satisfaction. A couple of our customers in February, Elbia Realty and California State University Dominguez Hills won the Smart Energy Decisions Innovation Award for using AI-driven storage services from STEM. It was very exciting. We just went to a great ribbon cutting over at Raytheon in Fullerton, California, where they flew in all the executives to learn about what they were doing with AI on site. That's, that's really powerful, and our sales growth is showing that that customer demand to have real-time energy optimization to manage their energy more granularly and then to participate in new ways in the market is showing in some of the analysts' projections of where storage is going to grow. 2.6 gigawatts over the next four years, half of it will be customer cited. And so is it a climate solution? Uh, storage writ large across the types of storage, whether bulk or customer cited? Absolutely. Will it be something that's reliable and flexible and uh, more time dependent and more locally dependent, usefully for the grid or for the, uh, the, the utility? Absolutely, and customers are absolutely gonna want to participate in this climate solution. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Polly. Uh, well, let's, let's move on um, to, the, to the question of the munis. Um, I'm a customer of LADWP, as I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are. Um, we've got Mike Webster here, the executive director of the Southern California Public Power Authority, SCAPA. Um, Mike, what is SCAPA? Uh, what do you guys do? What's your focus uh, around some of these clean energy and climate goals? Uh, I would guess that most of the audience doesn't know what SCAPA is, and really, should you? Because I represent, <laughs> <laughs> we, we are the secret weapon behind the municipal uh. utilities. So we have 12 municipal utilities in Southern California, represent about 25% of the load in California. And my job is to enable them to do things faster and more cost effectively. So we're pretty well known for renewables. For over the last decade, uh, through joint action, we've added over 2,000 megawatts of renewable energy for the benefit of all the Southern California municipal utilities and thus their customers. And that's pretty significant. Let me give you an example of, of the value we bring. So a solar project may cost X for 10 megawatt solar project, something that the city of Riverside would want. But if we can package that together amongst the 12 municipal utilities and do two or 300 megawatts, we can drive that cost down 15 to 20% because of the scale. And so we do large projects, we do small projects, but it's all for the benefit of deploying quickly and effectively for the municipal utilities. We have other projects as well, uh, but right now we're up to 39 projects. I think we're gonna be at 45 this year, and I see where we're gonna be 60, 70, 80 product, uh, projects over the course of the next decade as we ramp up to 50% collectively. So we're behind the scenes helping them. What you probably don't realize is how much we help on the energy efficiency space. We have 65 different contracts that are active right now. So again, if you're gonna buy 100 light bulbs, you're gonna get one price. 
You buy 10 million light bulbs, you're going to get a much lower price. And all of these benefits pass on to the municipal customers. And so with these 65 contracts, our members draw from that for energy efficiency, customer side programs. One of the exciting areas we're really looking at is electric transportation. We have multiple contracts now for EV chargers, EV installations, and our members draw from that and deploy those uh, moving forward. We're also starting to figure out batteries, quite frankly, and how we can be helpful in joint procurement of batteries, joint procurement and services for debt battery installation, whether it's utility scale or small scale. We just wrapped up an RFP for a massive storage uh, project uh, with different technologies. It's in the evaluation phase right now. So that's going to really help us integrate renewable energy. And what you probably don't know is one of the things we do is help with jobs. And I was talked about this morning is that to make all this technology happen, we need new people that have the skill sets to enable the utilities to thrive and survive in this environment. And so last year, we trained 1,000 people uh, in the municipal utility industry uh, on batteries and renewables and new technologies and integration and all of the things they need to know to be effective. Because my members are adding hundreds of engineers every year. We need to train them. The other thing we need to do is you got dinosaurs like me who are leaving the industry, end up at SCAPA, but we are also trying to train the executives of the future to run those utilities. And so that's an important part of what we are doing. And the last thing, and it's hard to put, make this tangible, but with municipal utilities working together, with municipal utilities working with the IOUs together, and starting to brainstorm where we're going in the future, effectively, these are the new things that's going to tr provide that tremendous value. So we've become kind of a think tank uh, amongst our utilities to find out the best practices so we move forward as effectively as possible. That's great. Thank you. Um, so we have, we've talked about you, the IOUs, we've talked about the munis. We've got another sort of emerging category that I want to go to next um, with Ted Bardicke. I, I, I was thinking of this group as the clean energy dream team. And I'm just going to run with this analogy for a minute here. Uh, maybe it's a horrible metaphor, but Ted, Ted Bardicke and the Clean Power Alliance is kind of like the sixth man <laughs> showing up to get in the game and, uh, you know, have some impact here on the clean energy dream team. And, and I, I, you know, Ted is the executive director of the new Clean Power Authority, which is the Southern California Community Choice Aggregator. And when the community choice aggregators came around um, in, uh, I think, around 2001, we had a very different picture of what the grid looked like um, uh, in terms of the mix of renewables and emissions. And part of the, the motivation for, that the legislature had in enabling cities to go with a, clean, a, a community choice aggregator was that cities had said, we want our own choice, we want cleaner energy, and we want to do it ourselves. We're going to, we're going to get rid of our uh, IOU procurement, we're going to do it ourselves. Now we're in a little bit of a different world. We've got, as you heard from Ron and from Mike, um, some incredible progress from the IOUs. Um, so I think, Ted, what would be helpful is give us a sense of sort of where the CCAs are playing a role now, what your hope is for the Clean Power Authority, and, and how things are going here in the, the first couple months of, of, the, of the Clean Power Authority. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, it's, it's a little humbling to be up here with folks like Ron and Mike, who I've learned a lot from, and we, we, we've spent sleepless nights together trying to get that port project up and the whole world of energy storage, so um, it's, 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 uh, it's really nice. So um, the, the Clean Power Alliance of Southern California, just to give you a little introduction and then I'll, that introduction will lead into the, the answer to the question. Um, we are a new joint powers authority, so we're a public agency. Um, 31 member agencies uh, uh, have across Southern California, across uh, Los Angeles and Ventura County, have come together over the past year to create this new organization. So we range uh, just geographically um, as far north as Ojai, um, as far south as Downey, as far east as Claremont, and uh, many of the west side coastal cities and a, and a bunch of stuff in between, as well as unincorporated LA County, which is a million people, and uh, unincorporated Ventura County. So at, 
at its sort of current state, we have um, about a million potential accounts or a million potential um, customers or meters um, across Southern California, um, across Edison territory. We're not in the Muni space uh, yet, and we. Uh, uh, well, 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 yeah, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, and there's a lot of potential to work with the Muni's because we are a public, we are a public agency, um, but we are uh, we we have 2,000 accounts right now operational. Um, we'll roll on another 30,000 accounts uh, on June 25th, and then beginning in 2019, um, make the, hopefully make this massive um, transition. What makes us different? What makes us um, unique? What makes us allow uh, allow us to uh, pursue clean power and be true to our name? Um, so the first thing is that we recognize that the current electricity system is under some stress. Regionalization is one way of dealing with the stress. Distributed energy is another um, place that we're dealing with the stress. Transportation, electrification. We're all sort of searching for this um, moment and how we're going to fix it. What we bring is the power of local government to that table. And local governments, what do they do? They um, have building code authority. They have land use and transportation influence in a big, big way. And they have a way of connecting with their customers, their citizens, their constituents, in a way that um, private companies often don't. Um, uh, they treat their, their folks as sort of in an interactive way. So if you think about what, how we're going to deal with this stress on the system of more and more and more renewables, we have to engage, um, the, all the utilities have to engage with their customers in a much different way than in the past. Um, we can't take them for granted. We need them to engage. We need them to be co-managers of their electricity consumption and production on a real-time basis. And you can't do that with passive people. So um, while the regionalization focus takes place as a, maybe a way of distributing costs, um, we're really focused on the local and what we can bring to that, to that table um, in creating some excitement and some engagement around how people um, consume and uh, produce power at the local level. Finally, um, I'd just like to note that uh, what keeps me up at night is um, I have a, but is also very exciting, is every one of those member agencies that joined the Clean Power Alliance got a seat on the board. So I, <laughs> so I have um, 31 local elected officials, mayors and city mayors and city council people um, on my board. Um, and uh, the level of knowledge and understanding about the energy world um, varies quite a bit among that, among that board. But what an incredible opportunity to educate our local leaders about this fundamental service that we all provide. Um, those are folks who are leaders. They will be future people in Sacramento. They are people who have come back from Sacramento. They engage with their constituents every single day. And to the extent that we can make them ambassadors in our local communities for the clean energy future, we're going to have a much more robust electricity system uh, going forward. So um, that's sort of where, where we're at. Um, we procure a lot of power. We'll be major players in the market. If, if uh, most of those customers decide to, potential customers decide to stay with us, we'll be the fourth largest load serving entity in the state. Um, and sort of start to get towards like those kinds of, 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 of SCAPA levels. So um, it's not going to be easy. It, electricity transformations or transformations of any kind of market, um, particularly when you're um, dealing with monopoly situations, are going to be, um, uh, you know, have some hairy moments, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I think it will all result in um, more 
cleaner power quicker um, with a more engaged constituency um, dealing with that. Cool. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I apologize to the audience for the basketball metaphor. I was just trying to think of, like, I'm, I'm, you're going to send me home. I'm going to go on that truthful site called Wikipedia, look at the list of six men of the year for the last 20 years, the, and figure out, like, who we embody. Is it the <laughs> microwave for people who remember the old Detroit Pistons? Or is it, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to figure this one out. It's going to be good. But it's not going to be a slam dunk. It's not going to be a slam dunk, for sure. I'm definitely thinking about the image of Let's move along to another topic. All right. um, okay. We hit on transportation a little bit, yeah. and I know that the, the previous panel did too, um, with a number of the leaders in the sort of manufacturing and delivery space, Walmart, Tesla, and others. But, you know, there really is this unbelievable convergence happening between the transportation sector and the power sector. Um, and everybody here has sort of a, a unique role in that space. And I think that as consumers begin to think about, okay, in the way that I go to a gas station now, I could go to a charger or I could seek advice from my utility or from my CCA, or I could have a distributed resource at my home uh, to fill up my car there are a lot of changes for the consumer, and I wonder if we can just start on a very basic level and, and talk about what this means from a rates perspective. Um, and I, I think, you know, I had thought maybe Ron or Mike um, or Ted might have some thoughts here, but I want to make sure that everybody on the panel has a chance to weigh in. Um, Polly, I know you mentioned uh, some thinking around the intersection between storage and transportation. Um, but I don't know, Ron, you want to kick yeah, us can, off with I, some I, rates? I, I can, and I can, I can be pretty brief on this because we did, as part of that pathway study, one of the things we want to look at is saying, what does this mean for rates? Because we're looking at, at doing things across the economy and using 80% carbon-free energy to be able to displace fossil fuel use at the end use in areas that we don't serve right now. And when we looked at that, including all of the efforts that, we, that I talked about include some efforts in building electrification as well, which I really didn't touch on. Um, all in, uh, we see that including some of the things we need to do to modernize our grid to be able to enable the, the types of things that, that Polly was talking about as well. We see that as a customer's bill between now and 2030 on average will be at or below the rate of inflation in terms of, in terms of that, that rate of increase, which is kind of historically what electric service in California has been for the last 30 years. It tends to be at or below the rate of inflation. So from that perspective, we think it's going to be very affordable. And more importantly, we think we're going to have a lot more dynamic opportunity for customers, um, whether, whether there are customers or perhaps or whether they're, they're, they're Ted's power supply customers, um, to, to be able to have options to keep to keep their costs uh, even lower than that. But it's doable, it's achievable. The key point of that is being able to make sure that we're getting our carbon reduction across the economy and not just trying to get it all out of this you know, constantly smaller slice of power supply. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so um, may Go I ahead. interject? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. A little bit futuristic view of rates is we really need to start thinking about how to have the right rate structures for electric vehicles because they need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem when you're thinking about building out infrastructure. And so there's a variety of ways to do that. It might be time of use, it might be real-time pricing, but it is certainly a future of much more dynamic pricing to send those signals to uh, the EV and truck users that they charge at the right time and that will help optimize the entire system. So I th really think that's a discussion we need to have within Southern California, not only in the POU world, but the other world, as IOUs and potentially the CCAs, as you start to get more involved in programs. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll um, sort of echo this, but also uh, note that, um, you know, when we talk about rates, people really want st stability the, often the overall 
rate is is less important than 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 the stability and the bill. Um, and what I think we need to start doing is understanding what are people's energy bills, including transportation. Um, and I think when we look at it that way, we all here have a common interest as all electricity people that you know the real competition here is with is with oil and gas and that we can um, make sure that we have stable sort of heating bills stable transportation rates bought through the electrification so people's bills may go up because they have or they're consuming more power but they're going to the gas station less and I think that, that we need to sort of start broadening that conversation of when we say rates, what do we, what do we actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, because as more and more of the fuel bill, people's overall fuel bill migrates towards electricity, because that's the way to reach our carbon goals, um, uh, we're going to deal with some cost shifting among, among fuel um, that we need to start putting out there as, as uh, a way of, yeah. of calculation. And the last thing I would say is that um, in this case, um, all of us have um, similar sort of business goals. If, if we as a CCA can drive more customers to consume the power that we procure on their behalf, those are going to be, that's going to be power that's going to be running over Edison transmission and distribution lines. Um, and we have some common interests there uh, to make that fuel shift. Yeah, and I think the point that you made about the stability of the bill is a really important one. We're seeing a lot of innovation in this area where you have companies like Inspire, um, Acadia Power, others who are seeking to sell a whole bunch of services together and think about almost a subscription type model where a consumer says, okay, I'll, I'll pay $100 a month. I don't really care what, how many kilowatt hours I've consumed or how many um, you know, therms of fuel, um, uh, I want a stable bill, I want to pay the same thing every month. And burden shifts to the provider to actually manage the uh, procurement and balancing. Polly, and that's, that's exactly the benefit of what we do. From what the cu customer's perspective that we see, they want automated savings. They don't want to get involved with having to manage their real time. The, the problem we have in America is that we're managing an electricity system for very rare, comparatively rare peak periods, such that 10% you know, of the peak it ends up being 40% of the system costs because we don't store electricity and we're operating on a very aging infrastructure. So I differ a little bit from Ted's comments. The, 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 what the utilities and the grid operators are seeing is that the timing of the kilowatt hour and the where the kilowatt hour occurs is becoming way more important than how much the kilowatt hours add up to. As the state moves more towards time of use rates and more complicated structures, you know, the, the, the customers are, are going to be challenged for trying to manage that. And that's the beauty of artificial intelligence with bundled services around DER that makes it automated, no manual intervention. They can go back to their plant operations or their school functions and not have to manage their energy. And what we're beginning to see is the customer looking for lots more bundled types of services and opportunities to participate in new types of programs. So we entertained a new, we, we began a new partnership with C Power to what we call save and earn. So they save uh, on their energy bills through a subscription service for AI-driven storage, but then they also earn money by participating in more DR programs with the C-Power offering together. We're working with a bunch of solar providers to do solar plus storage. You're seeing customers beginning to look at packaged EV, solar, DER plus storage. That's just, that demand is going to continue to grow, not just for the participation, but for the bundling of services where they don't actually have to manage it themselves. You know, what's interesting, when you say bundling, I'm going to just put this business model on this head. Uh, in my former life, and I tell people I'm buying my way back into the pearly gates because I used to be an investment banker, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> anyway. but, but I say that in that when you think of bundling, um, you think of uh, if you're a, a corporation, I'm going back to the customer because, again, without the customer, this panel is not here. So if you go back to the corporate customer, and you know, I'm going to use the example of the project that we did in, uh, in Los Angeles, the Westmont project. Yeah. 
You know exactly what I'm talking <laughs> about. So here you had an opportunity where you could use your roof space as an asset. So if you're a CFO, you look at the capex. You have to replace a roof, let's say, every 20 years. And what they've done is they've now taken the cost of the roof, they've actually and I amortized it over the life of a solar contract. And what you're doing is, and if, that, if, the, if the cost of the roof plus the power that you're now generating, or you're paying for, is cheaper, you basically have avoided cost savings, and you got a subsidized and or free roof. So what people are doing is they're using a bundling concept where they can use renewable energy, but also there is a direct capex relief effect. So again, I know it's not relevant to the transportation, but from the financing standpoint, folks like myself like it. Because if you're, if you're going to buy an asset and you're going along credit, AA credit, or whatever that credit, the offtake credit is going to be, you're basically getting more cash flow associated with that credit. And you're giving the customer another reason to, go re to use renewables because now they can see a direct benefit. One of the challenges I I've seen in the space is I was at the Greenbiz conference a couple, a couple weeks ago. These are the nicest people I have ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the absolute nicest people. The problem is when you go, and, and, and uh, here we're second. the problem is when you go and you're translating something back to someone like myself on the finance side, if you don't know about hurdle rate, opportunity cost, and things of that, and that, if that's not a part of your dialogue, it's very difficult to get a customer to think about this. So, I'm talking with the, probably the more sophisticated corporate customers, but again, what we have to do is, if we can bundle something, somebody sees value that they're getting, it's easier to sell it to them because, again, you're dealing with kilowatt, megawatt, giga, I mean, the list goes on and on, and people just sit there and they look at their utility bill and they're very confused. I think if we democratize it, make it simpler, I think you know, you'll have a lot, more, a lot more acceptance, in particular with uh, the energy storage. We did our first energy storage deal uh, a couple, couple weeks ago. We're going to do more. But when we went through the modeling of it, the, 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 the software companies who were doing the models, it was so difficult to understand, difficult to understand the value we're getting. So what we did is we said, look, forget those models. If you're going to make a million, if you're making an investment, and it's a $5 million investment, and the storage now is going to be an extra million. So it's now $6 million. Let's amortize that over the life of the deal, what is the return on that? Because again, there was a lot of volatility associated with time of use, is the utility going to change uh, the regulatory you know, spectrum, the list goes on and on. So again, there's a lot of, from my perspective as, an, as a private investor, there's a lot of confusion around that space. It, it is tough. I mean, Rocky Mountain Institute uh, has a wonderful wheel that shows the 13 services that are offered by energy storage. Uh, behind the meter for the grid operator, the utility, and the customer, so backup capacity or frequency regulation or, you know, um, uh, ramping and so on. And uh, the regulators are far behind us in understanding how to unlock the full potential and then articulate that value and make it a market-worthy product. So thank you, CalISO, because, for example, we're working with the CalISO staff on a load shift product that might be able to absorb the belly of the duck. It's yet another tool in the toolbox to throw at that incredible 13 gigawatt ramp that we saw last month that we can solve. You know, 13 gigawatts is a little scary when you think about the size of where the storage is right now, but the eclipse showed us that the ramp rate during the eclipse, 70 to 90 megawatts per minute, it's totally within bounds of what storage can do. So if we throw more policies and products at this to unlock the full potential for energy storage, that'll help to articulate the value for those financing models. I'm going to take just a second on the regulatory piece, because you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that, um, that the regulators deal with is they have a whole process that they've had for decades. And they have difficulty, because of the history of that process, to be able to move as swiftly as technology is moving. We are the number one right now. On Glad to have somebody else become number one. But we are the number one battery storage um, implementer, if you will, on, on, on a utility system right now. And we are still learning some of those things. What are the different types of things that we can do? What, what are the value that we can wrench out of battery storage? And some of the things that stop us from being able to do that, and this is not negative on the commission, it's just a reality, is we can't change rate structures quickly enough. We can't contract for something adequately or if we go into a contract through a third party and say, well, it's got to be competitive, 
and these are the exact things you do. But in the middle of that whole process, we learned like, wow, batteries could do this too. Well, you've signed a contract that doesn't include that. So sorry, I can't give that to you. So see, the Those are the types of things that we're going to have to find a way to move a lot more quickly um, in, in changing rates and changing structures and changing things that we can do to partner with our customers mm -hmm. better. Yeah. So, so here's the challenge real quick. <laughs> sorry, we're, we're, we're literally sitting beside each other because when I go to my investment committee and I cannot explain the regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for me to come out and, 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 and get a yay from investment committee. So, so what that does, that's going to, that, that, that precludes the level of private capital that can come in because of the regulatory risk associated with it. So I'm just using that. I'm not no, trying to take no, a oh, take no, a. No, no, are you familiar okay. with the law offices of Covington and Burling, which provides uh, <laughs> regulatory <laughs> legal advising? Uh, I want to I bundle up a few, um, a few of the other topics, because we actually are, are running low on time. And it, we, we touched on a, on a few things, which I think are all intertwined. Um, so um, let me just throw them out for the group. But um, you know, we talked about cleaning up the grid so that when you buy electricity for your car, it's 100% clean energy, or it's as low greenhouse gas emissions as possible. We talked about the regionalization of the grid, which plays into this discussion on whether it's 80% clean energy or 100% clean energy. And we talked about equity. We talked about ensuring that those benefits, and we heard uh, <coughs> Senator De Leon today uh, recognize California with the dubious distinction of being number one in uh, ozone pollution and, and in the top 10 for all kinds of other air pollution. Um, and, and so this issue of how do we ensure that the benefits and the harms are equally distributed, um, these all sort of mesh together. And I, I wonder if um, I could just throw this out to the group and, 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 and raise this for discussion. I know it's somewhat of a, of a vague question, but I know you're all working on um, issues core to, to each of those items. Yeah, I'd like to dive into the 100% issue because uh, LADWP, my largest member, I think has established a leadership position in the nation on how to move forward. But first, I think we need to ask this question, and for all those empty chairs that went over to the museum to look at art, when, they, when they're over there looking at it, they're going to have 10 different opinions of what that art is, right? And I think that if I were to say, well, what is 100%, I'm going to have 10 different opinions. So is it 100% California compliant with all the bucket one, two, and three? Is that what it is? Is it 100% renewables, which might include large hydro? Is it 100% kind of an accounting process? I buy, I need 100,000 gigawatts, I buy 100,000 gigawatts, I'm 100%. Well, what about two in the morning? Is it about, you know, being uh, completely fossil free? Is that what this is? And I think my members are wrestling with this, trying to figure this out, and I think it's really about uh, being greenhouse gas free and looking at the portfolio programs to get there. But the process is really a two-step process, and this is what I want to bring LA back into the equation, is that they've had to do a very extensive study. They hired uh, NREL to have an independent look as how would you do this, and they have to look at different ways and different definitions and come up with those costs and schedules, which then can inform the policy discussion. Now, it's not sequential. It has to go sort of hand in hand. You have to do the analysis, have the policy discussion at the same time, and it's iterative, especially as technology starts to evolve in the future it's not something that we can say 100% one and done. It's going to be a progress report to get there over the course of time as these technologies come to be. So my members are supportive of 100%. Uh, they do want to go that direction. They want to do it logically with lots of dialogue. They don't want to just pick a number. And at the same time, they want to recognize that an LA has a different makeup than a city of Colton or Vernon, and it's very much city by city dependent, so there needs to be room for that real local sort of viewpoint, like the CCAs. It's going to be different for each city. Well, I think in, in addition, going back to the issue of having that available for all your customers, when we, we took a look, we, we aspirationally see, let's get to 100%. We chose the 80% number by 2030, which we think is pretty quick. 
doubling the amount of carbon-free energy that we have today statewide. We feel we need to get there, <clears throat> but and a big piece of that is distributed solar. But we have over 50% of our customers, irrespective of income levels, that don't own their roofs. So we need to find ways to be able to have things like, like distributed solar, community solar, doing that in a way that minimizes the amount of, of, of cost shift to the people who aren't participating in that. So as we move down the pike, we need to, I, I agree with Mike on this one. Let's, let's work through, let's see, what, see how we get with each step. Let's make sure that we're providing these benefits across the economic spectrum, across the geographic spectrum, uh, and across the ethnic spectrum in, in our service territories to, to, to make this happen. And frankly, we don't know what the technologies are gonna be probably a, a decade from now. We may not know what they are five years from now. So we, we will constantly be learning and trying to find a way to apply that as we see how close can we get to 100%, checking along the way to make sure we're doing that as cost effectively as we can. I have a slightly different angle as well on the equity question. As we move into an ability to use standalone products like storage or solar or combinations of DERs, it really begets this question of how granularly can we plan I mean, we executed into the wholesale market last year 600 uh, dispatches. Hundreds of them were on a five-minute call. AI gives you that visibility at the grid edge of very tight planning. That gives standalone products or bundles of DERs the ability to work with the utility and the regulators to look at what can be deferred or avoided for infrastructure build-out. We know we're going to have to build a lot, and especially in the transportation electrification, as we look at what needs to be prioritized and what could be avoided or deferred to avoid stranded assets, that comes back in ramifications for ratepayers to use the electricity infrastructure in the most efficient and maximal benefit way of these DERs, whether it's on a particular site or around that site using other enablers. Richard, I wonder, you, you have had a bird's eye view of some of this stuff from a regulatory perspective, both at the Energy Commission and at the ISO. When we talk about 50% by 2030 RPS, or we talk about 80% clean energy by 2030, um, can, can we get there? <coughs> well, we, we probably can, but we don't, don't know exactly how. It's a, I think it relates to the, the comments about new technologies that are gonna be coming had us over a five to 10 year time span. Um, I think generally I say that we're confident and I, I think uh, people that we, we deal with, which is members of this panel, would also agree that um, you can, you, we're gonna be, we're gonna do it, but you don't know exactly how uh, because there's in, innovative technologies that uh, are going through an increasing rationalization, so they're going to, their product is going to cost less. That'll mean uh, something that, in the in the construct of uh, how do we get there, you know, now this will become a major factor. But um, I, I would say, again, going back to the sort of general impression, I think that that it'll get done, but we're not exactly sure how it'll get done. Uh, when somebody makes a, makes a more definitive move than all of the other players in, in the uh, arena of, of generating electricity, using it, will will respond with more um, more attention to this proposed uh, way or manner of, of uh, getting the getting the most out of the resources that we have and uh, having. Uh, new opportunities present themselves for, um, for well, for, for the, the, the good of the, of the, uh, the good of the republic. Let's put it that way. Sure. Well, I'm getting the bat signal from the wings, <laughs> and I think that that's as good of a point to end on as any. And that we've gotten a vision for how we're going to get there. We know we will get there. We don't know exactly how we'll do it, but we know that these people will get us there. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just add one, one, one final comment. When, 
the, the standards for the, for the um, renewal of portfolios were discussed and debated. There was much, much discussion that really boiled down to my wishful thinking versus your wishful thinking as to how we're going to do it and what, what, when the consequences will be correct. Um, I think once, once the, uh, the technical side of the energy business had to, to um, respond to these goals, uh, then you know they, they, they were, all sorts of things were found out about them that, that were not anticipated when originally uh, executed as, as le in legislation. And I think this is going to be a continuing process. We will get enthused about something; it'll, it'll sort of work, and then as you get more, get more into it, uh, you need to to, uh, to adopt yet another um, way of proceeding or another policy in order to realize the, the goals and the value of the goals that uh, were initially positive. Right. And we've always seen that California has a long and proud history of setting ambitious goals and then exceeding them. So maybe actually how we could end is why don't we do a lightning round where we just go one by one and if you could predict when we get to the year 2030 what percentage of our energy mix will be, you can either predict renewable or clean energy. I'll give you that latitude, but just a number, lightning round, and then Energy or electricity. I'm sorry? Energy or electricity. Ener <laughs> let's say electricity, <laughs> for simplicity's <laughs> sake. <laughs> really? Mike? Okay, I think we're gonna be at least 70%, easily 70% clean energy. 80. I say 80. Well, obviously, I have to say 80. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our plan. We've got a plan, so we're going to make it. Right. And since I always have to be greener than him, <laughs> I'll say 81. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, and thank you to LABC for hosting this panel. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that panel, and um, it was interesting to hear the panelists talk about with optimism and, and uh, dedication of how we're going to get there and meet those goals, because um, uh, you may not be aware of this in the blizzard of news lately, but um, there was, this was re recently an issue that was taken up in Washington when uh, the Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry, had decided that all this renewable energy is making the grid unstable, and, and uh, there needs to be a mandate that more um, coal and, and nuclear energy get um, get used in the states and uh, Trump's um, appointees to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission actually rejected Perry's plan um, in large part because they have faith in uh, the, this kind of vision that the grid will remain stable um, and these goals can be met. So we're going to move on to uh, our next panel now. And um, we, it's, it's focused on the future of our water resources and water management in California. With the major announcement that MWD has approved $11 billion for the California Twin Tunnel Project to remake the state's water system, it's a timely discussion right now. And, but first, I'd like to welcome John D.S. Allen, who's the board president for the Water Replenishment District. He's going to introduce our final keynote speaker of the day. Thank you, Evan. The Water Replenishment District of Southern California is proud to partner with the Los Angeles Business uh, Council on this sustainability summit. In fact, WRD has been working on sustainability since our inception in 1959. For nearly 60 years, WRD has been managing two of the nation's most utilized groundwater basins which currently serve over 4 million of Los Angeles County's residents. Half our district's water supply comes from the aquifers we are responsible for. WRD's goal is for individual agencies like ours to be completely locally sustainable uh, in, uh, in groundwater. 
we will, we will achieve that goal by the end of this year. With the completion of the Albert Robles uh, Center, formerly known as the Groundwater Reliability Improvement Project, we will completely eliminate our need for imported water from Northern California and from the Colorado River. When complete, the Robles Center will provide an, an additional 21,000 acre feet annually of local water that will then percolate back into the ground and eventually be used as drinking water. And we're not stopping there. WRD has a plan that can help the 43 cities in our district eliminate their reliance on imported water completely. However, enough about us. Today I have the pleasure to introduce Carla Nemeth, the director of the California Department of Water Resources. Before becoming director in January of this year, Ms. Nemeth worked as Governor Brown's deputy secretary and senior advisor for water policy while at the California Natural Resources Agency. She has also served as the Bay Delta Conservation Plan project manager from 2009 to 2014. Earlier ro roles includes, include those at the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District and Jones and Stokes. Altogether, Ms. Nemeth brings with her over 15 years of experience with environment and water issues. Please join me in welcoming Carla Nemeth to the stage. Uh, hi there. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Carla Namath. I'm the recently appointed director of the Department of Water Resources. Um, it's an honor to be here with you at the Sustainability Summit to talk about water. And I love the fact that this summit is looking at all facets of sustainability through a very broad and holistic lens. Examining these issues across multiple sectors, water, energy, business, transportation, um, is hugely important uh, because that's how we get to a more sustainable California. The immediacy and complexity of the issues uh, requires bringing all sectors together uh, to understand each other's ideas and, and see how we can uh, forge a path forward. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what the Brown administration is accomplishing in terms of water sustainability uh, in these closing months. I do believe we are at a transformational moment when it comes to the environment, especially with water in California. And I, I don't use that term, transformational moment, uh, cavalierly. And it's not just in reference to the historic vote last week at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, uh, but that is part of it. I use a uh, transformational moment in reference to our understanding and aspirations for water and the value that we place on water. After five years of drought, followed by a record-breaking year of precipitation, then massive wildfires and scorched huge swatches of land last fall, I think Californians really understand water in a way they haven't before. And I liken it to uh, previous campaigns that really turn the corner on, on energy, on pollution, and littering. I think that it is water's time for this transformational moment, and I think as water managers in California, we absolutely uh, need to seize that, seize that moment. Um, those of us here have already embraced a new way of thinking about the environment and technology's role in uh, helping us be stewards of that environment, but I want the public to make that same embrace, especially when it comes, uh, when it comes to water. We need to be telling the stories about how we use water in California. Uh, many water managers here uh, prefer the cloak of invisibility because that means we're really doing our job. Um, but that's not going to get us uh, to a sustainable future. Uh, relying on a lack of awareness, if you will, to be a, a signature of our success is, um, 
it's really outdated thinking. And so uh, the department really uh, wants to partner with water managers throughout the state and uh, participate in these kinds of summits to actually tell some pretty inter interesting stories that the public can relate to so that they understand what it means moving forward to uh, use our water more sustainably. I think the new relationship between water and the environment um, the way I like to think about it, I was inspired by a book that came out several years ago and it, it referred to our environment as a rambunctious garden. And that author uh, was uh, a woman by the name of Emma Maris. And what she basically posits is that uh, we are not at a place in time where we can return nature to its pristine pre-human state. And that the sooner we can accept that, the better we can plan for our future in a way that actually manages the environment for better outcomes. Maris argues that we have to accept this, uh, we have to accept our altered landscape, and that our guiding principle moving forward needs to be a deliberate tending to that rambunctious garden that really is a, a mix of human management and our wild surroundings. I think it's an apt description for where we are in terms of California water management. Um, here in California, we like to talk about um, what's called an all of the above approach to sustainable water supply. Um, but I prefer to think of it as a holistic approach, how all these different elements work together. And one of the challenges of working in the water world is we're very factionalized. Um, the state has certain responsibilities, but an enormous amount of those responsibilities are invested uh, at the local level. And the more that we can do to connect uh, those uh, water agencies with local land uses, the better off we'll be in California. Uh, but the Department of Water Resources has a hugely important role to play in working with local water managers to make those supplies more sustainable. We absolutely must protect our watersheds because that's our water source. And we must conserve water uh, because our actions with usage are just as important as our actions to store, move, and reuse water. We are using new technologies in water conservation, um, from on-farm conservation techniques to leak detection to water metering. Technology is helping us to make water uh, conservation a way of life. Uh, it will be the underpinning of new projects in California that help us achieve a degree of sustainability, whether it's better science to support recycled water projects or uh, innovative new uh, uh, water diversions that can uh, lessen the impact on uh, the uh, native fisheries that share those streams uh, with us, or new technologies to help uh, recharge groundwater aquifers. Um, all of that activity actually is the essence of Californians tending to its rambunctious garden. Um, I think for too long in California, we've been living with a, uh, a kind of a zero-sum game when it comes to water, which is sort of my loss is your gain and vice versa. And I think that's born out of, um, out of a long history um, with uh, very intense and deepening narratives that don't suit us for the future. And part of our challenge is how do we actually change that narrative so we can actually uh, be the change that we're trying to make. Um, nowhere is this more intense than in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, which as you all may be aware is kind of the hub of the state's uh, water delivery system. Um, the state of California, together with the federal government, uh, provides water to 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture in California and 27 million Californians. Um, the narrative in the Delta um, around uh, uh, the Governor Brown's proposals to, uh, to fix that piece of aging infrastructure um, is, uh, I think it's a false narrative. It's a narrative where we have two choices, which is to uh, destroy the Delta um, by moving too much water out of it um, or, uh, or effectively uh, restore it uh, back to its pristine condition. We can do neither of those things. Um, 
as a, a flagship of the governor's uh, water proposals, Water Fix, I believe, is a hugely important project for all of California. Um, it's a way to divert water in a system that is fundamentally threatened uh, by climate change and do so in a way that is definitively safer for California's native fisheries, allows us to capture water during uh, high storm events uh, and store those flows, uh, store that water supply in underground uh, and above ground storage to reuse that water, uh, to recharge our groundwater basins and clean them up, um, and ultimately um, use that water in a more efficient way. Uh, if we want to do recycling and, uh, and groundwater cleanup in the Southland, we really need to stabilize this key uh, feature of California's water supply. Um, but today, uh, California is doing a lot more than, um, than simply uh, the California Water Fix project. Um, Fifty years after the State Water Project uh, came online, in the face of climate change, we have a lot of other decisions to make about how we address our aging infrastructure. Um, nowhere has that issue been made more apparent than uh, the Oroville Dam uh, in Northern California off the Feather River. Um, many of you probably watched on TV with the rest of the country and indeed an international audience as we saw a key uh, piece of that infrastructure fail under uh, intense uh, storm pressures last year. Uh, the department is uh, in an active recovery process, but over time we're going to need to take a look at how we prepare that facility for the future. Um, there are all kinds of new smart technologies that we can embed in those kinds of large infrastructure projects that will enable us to manage them in real time. Um, I'm very excited about the potential for improved forecasting that uh, that takes the temperature of incoming storm events at a much more granular level that will enable us to uh, manage the system uh, far more effectively and efficiently for all these multiple purposes, for public safety purposes, for water supply purposes, and for environmental purposes. Right now, the California Water Commission is making important decisions about how to invest public money uh, in new underground water storage and new reservoirs. This is important because it's the first state investment uh, in water storage in decades. And we've never done it in this way before, um, which is to acknowledge that uh, these kinds of facilities can be operated for multiple important purposes, again, in the context of an already manipulated environment. And, uh, and so I'm enthused about uh, the decisions we're about to make to invest significantly in these kinds of environmental and public benefits. Um, moving forward, uh, the department is, has big plans to uh, uh, invest in new technologies that can um, help our, our water system respond more in a more real-time situation to California's changing hydrology and environmental pressures. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are heavily engaged with um, UC Davis and NASA in improved forecasting and satellite monitoring of groundwater levels. Um, the state actually has a uh, research vessel uh, that we invested in uh, a year and a half ago, and it's a, essentially a floating laboratory that is out on the, the California Delta, and it allows us to monitor in real time where fisheries are in the estuary, and that helps us uh, operate the water system in a way that is ultimately much safer than much safer uh, for the environment um, that uses the estuary, the, the fishery species that use the estuary, uh, and move water when it's safe uh, for public use. Um, we also have some high-tech uh, underwater cameras that, that help us engage in that, uh, in that process as well. And these are the kind of things that I hope the department can, uh, can publicize, uh, can work better with new kinds of media to make sure that uh, an interested public can understand um, the precision, the exciting precision, uh, and the importance of science in, in managing our, water, our precious water resource in, in California. Um, 
Many of you may be aware that California finally passed a, a groundwater management law. We were woefully behind the rest of the country and the rest of the Western United States. Um, interestingly, Southern California um, had a much better history of, of working on it uh, voluntarily. But it's been hugely important for the state to uh, pass a law that requires all groundwater basins to be managed sustainably by 2040, which seems like a long time off. And I, um, I respect and admire the people who talk to me with intense impatience about that. I, I do understand that. Um, the challenge is it's a problem that's been decades in the making, and so it is going to take us a long time to emerge from that, and there's important work that needs to be done right away. Um, recently, the Department of Water Resources created a visual tool for local agencies and the public to access uh, groundwater data, and it's been data that's been collected over the last 30 years, but we really had no portal to share it with local governments and the public. It's these kinds of, I think, foundational data management issues that are really going to uh, provide uh, better information uh, for all Californians so that we have a, an improved understanding of how we make decisions around water management. Uh, I do want to say uh, one thing. I see that I'm, I'm getting the signal, and I appreciate it. Um, I do want to say one thing about collaboration. You know, as I mentioned, um, what's challenging about water management in California is that um, there's a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of different roles and responsibilities that we all share. And collaboration is not something that's often touted. In fact, I think our psyche is really driven by the water wars of California. But there's a lot to be uh, excited about relative to collaboration. And I believe um, that is the only path forward. Uh, and the department is going to um, work on all of its programming to ensure that um, we are working with local water agencies to understand the water resource sustainability issues more locally, um, to provide that local assistance in a way that helps them achieve uh, their local water supply security. Uh, one of the great things about working for Governor Brown is he occupies um, well, he occupies many uh, philosophical spaces at once, and in water, he really embraces this idea that we have to think big and also act small. So that's why he has been so focused on what he can do to uh, modernize uh, our physical infrastructure that delivers water all over the state, to do it in a way that's more respectful of, uh, of our environment, and do it in a way that is very much interconnected with all the local supply goals that you all have here in Southern California. So. I thank you for uh, the audience this afternoon. I uh, commend you for your participation and interest, and uh, I'm eager for the department to be your partner. Thank you. Now joining the stage is our final panel of the day, Modernizing Water Management, Resources, and Security, moderated by David Nahai, partner at Lewis, Brisboy, Bisgard, and Smith. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. How are you all doing? <coughs> That's not much of a response. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the day. Then you know, you you've had lunch. Session. You've had a great panel so far. You're about to witness what I believe will be the best panel of the day. <laughs> so how are you all doing? <laughs> all right. Good one. Um, before we start, let's have uh, really a round of applause for LABC, uh, Mary Leslie, Brad Cox, Nadine Watt, uh, Adam Lane, uh, uh, Candice, Carla, uh, Devon, the whole team. They do this every year, and it's always a marvelous conference that they put on. So let's thank them for their work. All right, this panel, uh, uh, the title of the panel is Modernizing Water Management Resources and Security. Um, and I promise we'll get to all of that, but, but we'd like to do it through the lens of our need here in Los Angeles to reduce our dependence on imported water. 
Uh, so during the time frame from 2012 to 2016, on average, we imported something like 84, 85% of the water that we use. About 20% of it came from the Owens Valley, and another 64% came from the Colorado River and from the Sacramento Delta through the work of the Metropolitan Water District. And Jeff Keitlinger, the general manager of MWD, uh, is here with us today. Now, we've long recognized in this city that importing 85% of our water is just not sustainable. And over the last 10 years, there have been various plans that have been put forward uh, in order to promote and increase wastewater recycling, stormwater capture, greater conservation, remediating our aquifer in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, and the truth is that a tremendous amount of work has been done, and a lot more work still uh, remains to be done. Um, and more recently, we have uh, Mayor Garcetti's mandate uh, that we must source 50% of the water that we use from local resources, so that we'll be importing just 50% of the water that, uh, that we use here, down from what I've said has been an average of, of 84 per, uh, percent. That's a tremendous uh, task that has to be uh, accomplished. So today, we're going to talk about all aspects of water. We're going to talk about conservation, uh, uh, imported water, uh, local water supplies, the private sector, public-private partnerships. Uh, we're going to talk about innovative management tools, um, so we'll cover this whole gamut, and we'll do it in the next about hour uh, and, a, and a quarter. So I'm going to start by introducing our stellar uh, group of panelists. I will then pose one question to each of them. Uh, they have agreed amongst themselves that they will each take no more than four or five minutes to answer <laughs> that question, and I want you to enforce that rule, <laughs> um, because, you know, I... I I was saying goodbye to my puppy, Gus, this morning, and I forgot to put on my wristwatch. <laughs> um, I'll blame it all on Gussie. As a result of that, I have to depend on my cell phone to keep time. So if they go over five minutes, you're to say, oi, you've gone over five minutes. <laughs> all right. So, so our panelists. To my immediate left is uh, Assemblymember Laura Friedman. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Next is Dr. Mark Gold, who is the, um, uh, who is the Vice Chancellor of UCLA. Uh, he also serves on the board of the Metropolitan Water District uh, and on the Mayor's Water Cabinet. Please welcome Dr. Mark Gold. <laughs> Next, Mr. Jeff Keitlinger is the General Manager of the Metropolitan Water District. <laughs> See, I, I'm asking them to applaud before you say anything. <laughs> that way we're, <laughs> we're safe. Um, uh, Enrique Zaldivar is the, is the director and the general manager of Sanitation LA. Please welcome Enrique. <laughs> Next, Virginia Grabian is the chief strategy officer for Parsons. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and Mr. Deepak Garg, is the chairman and founder of Smart Energy Water. Okay, let's, let's get started then with, uh, is it okay if we go on first name basis from Absolutely. here on? In? Okay, because to be referring to as assembly member and doctor and <laughs> take up too much time. So if I may, yeah, Laura. Of course. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, you know, we, we're not going to be able to reduce our dependence on imported water unless we conserve more. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, in looking forward, LADWP actually views conservation as a new water resource. Um, you have been, uh, in your short tenure as an assembly member, a truly prolific legislator. I mean, you've stood out for your ability to, to navigate the political process in Sacramento and actually get your bills passed. And you've taken on water and you've taken on water conservation. And I'm thinking uh, especially about AB um, 1669. Mm -hmm.
can you tell us a little bit about that legislation, why you think it's necessary, uh, what it's going to accomplish, what the next steps are, and what just the, uh, the challenges are to getting it through the process in Sacramento. Thanks, and I have four minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you. You, since you are elected, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so that bill and its companion, SB 606, are two bills that seek to make water conservation a way of life in California. So in the past, when we've looked at legislative attempts to deal with water conservation, um, a lot of what we see is per, uh, targets of percentage reductions. And we certainly see that when we are in drought. And Governor Brown says, OK, we're in a drought. Everybody has to now cut back 15% on their water usage. Well, that might be easy if you're in an area that's not very efficient um, in terms of a juice of water, but if you're in a community where you've been saving water for years, you've done the drip irrigation, you take two-minute showers, reducing another 15% is very difficult. So what the legislation seeks to do is to switch to a water budgeting approach that says that over time, everyone in the state will have a target that they have to meet for indoor water use, for, for urban water use, you know, being residential, that everyone has this goal, and it's not individually, no one's gonna go to your home and look at your usage, it goes by your water agency, they get a target, and then they help you live within it. What, so it, it is, seeks to establish a baseline for the first time across the state of California so that everybody is equally responsible for water efficiency. It also tries to foster those kinds of investments from agencies that help people be more efficient rather than cut back. Because if you're more efficient, you have more water to use in the ways that you want to use it. The example I like to give is, you remember when we were in the energy crisis, everyone would run around their house turning their lights off, unplugging all of their appliances to save energy. And then over time, we mandated a certain levels of energy efficiency in appliances, in light bulbs, and we made all of those things much more energy efficient. So now if you leave your iPad plugged in, once it's charged, it stops drawing power out of the wall, so you don't have to unplug it. And now you have light bulbs that are much more energy efficient, so it's good to turn off your lights, but if you don't, you don't have to run home and do it to save energy. It's, it's drawing so little energy. We need to get to the same place with water. We need everyone in the state to have water efficient appliances, to think of efficiency as just to, to build it into your everyday life so that it's much more painless than it is right now for, for folks. And we can do that by setting those targets and having the agencies work with their public to get them on that path to efficiency in whatever way is best for that particular community based on where they are within those goals. So that's the legislation in a nutshell. And there's also management plans so that every few years, all agencies, agricultural and urban, have to have approved plans. Because during the drought, we saw that some agencies like MWD were really great about their planning and some agencies across the state, not so much. So trying to get all of the agencies to have very good, resilient drought, drought contingency plans. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. We'll come back to that with another round of questions, but thanks so much for that. <laughs> Um, Mark, uh, uh, you have just a, a remarkable record uh, as an environmentalist, as, uh, as the head of uh, Heal the Bay, and you've done wonderful work at UCLA on the water cabinet as a board member at, at MWD. Um, you're also very instrumental in the, uh, in, in the crafting of the UCLA Sustainable uh, Grand Challenge. And one of the components of that Grand Challenge for Los Angeles um, is the concept that we're going to source 100% of our water locally. Um, now, we have that 100% uh, number out there, but this is at a time when the mayor's mandate is for 50%. Mm -hmm. And of course, most very recently, just the other day, we had the MWD board uh, take a vote to fund the lion's share of, uh, of, the, of the financing for the construction of two tunnels to convey water from the north to south. Um, those, those thoughts uh, uh, you know, foster and support the notion that we're going to continue to have a substantial amount of imported water. So my question is, as, as inspiring and, uh, and ambitious as the 100% number is, um, to what extent is it realistic? And what is it that we would have to do in order to, to gain, uh, to attain that number? Uh, thanks, David. Um, 
it, what universities do is we try to push the envelope and let people know what the possible is. And, um, and we've been doing a great deal of research. Um, we have 200 different faculty across all disciplines at UCLA that are, that are focusing on the Sustainable LA Grant Challenge. We have more than 45 research projects that are underway with 75 different faculty working on those projects. And about a third of them are in the water space, including the work that, that me and my team have been working on, which is really looking at City of LA, actually in partnership with um, Enrique's crew in the Bureau, Bureau of Sanitation, um, looking at LA sort of as, a, as a, um, a, you know, a test case on how far could you actually move to water self-sufficiency. Um, and we just finished a series of uh, four different studies. It took us about three years to put it together on what is actually feasible. And it's helped inform what Enrique, I'm sure, is going to talk about is, is, is their ambitious one water plan. Um, what Mayor Garcetti came up with was incredibly bold um, a few years ago, um, back in, I think it was 2013, when Executive Directive 5 came out. Um, and it's not inconsistent with what we're saying, because it, 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 to get to where we're saying is by 2050. Um, and so that's a, a great midway point to, to get to. And what it really is, is to make people think about um, uh, what are we doing on water recycling? What are we doing on stormwater capture? What are we doing on maximizing um, pr um, production from our groundwater basins rather than just leaving them contaminated and actually start moving in a more pump and treat approach um, like the city of LA is finally moving in that direction. San Gabriel Valley and Santa Monica started that a, a while back um, and the potentials there. And then of course on conservation. I mean, you, you heard from uh, Assembly Member Friedman um, you know, conservation is a way of life. Um, the urgency for that has never been greater. We're, we're seeing what happened backsliding-wise. We're back to the same water consumption patterns that we had back in 2013. Um, and so uh, we did a great job during a drought. We're, we're always good in California in a crisis. We have a long history of that. Um, but we need to do much better on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we're talking about water self-sufficiency, a huge part of that is you look at other cities around the world and what they've been able to thrive on, whether it's in Australia or Western Europe or um, various other different um, uh, places around the world, South Asia, um, and how they've been able to thrive on about half as much um, water um, as we have and still be hugely economically productive. Um, and it gives you the realm of the possible. And so by doing this sort of work um, and, and partnering with um, local government, state government, um, local agencies, business community, et cetera. I think having the, these sorts of discussions on what's feasible, maybe we don't get to 100% self-sufficiency by 2050, but we all know we could do a heck of a lot better on local water than what we're doing right now, and 50% is a great target for 2035, but I think everyone in this room, if you throw in, in, in um, what we're doing on conservation and what the potential is, we realize we can even do more than mm -hmm. that. And, th and that's what our studies demonstrated just for the city of LA, is that if, if, if you just you know, did think about Hyperion and how much recycled water potential um, is there, you know, that could be up to 150,000 to 200,000 acre feet if you look at the whole city of LA system. We have 270,000 acre feet per year going down the LA River that's uncaptured on an average year. Um, you know, our groundwater basins, we're not even getting close to what we could get from the standpoint of, of, of sustainable yield. Um, and so there's so much potential, and um, it's a really exciting time where you really feel like one water is going to happen um, in, in a big way. And it's great to see LA County, who's not on this panel, with the safe clean water measure um, ahead of us, which that could be 300 to 400 million dollars a year coming to LA County and all 88 of the cities within LA County. Um, to look at, to, to really capture more of stormwater for local water supply, as well as finally cleaning up our polluted waterways. So it's a good time to really be having these sorts of discussions. Right. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the stormwater fee. I want to throw that out to the panel to, uh, to, to discuss. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right in that, in that we do need as a society to make the investments necessary to make sure that, that our water future in this city is secure. So th thank you for that. Um, uh, Jeff, if I may uh, turn to you uh, uh, next. Um, so your agency is one of the largest wholesalers of water, I think certainly in the nation, um, uh, if, if not beyond. Uh, you uh, bring water to 19 million people uh, from the Colorado River and from the Sacramento Delta. Um, I think 
you know, perhaps only aliens living in some other solar system <laughs> will not have heard of the California water fix. Um, because has everybody heard of the California water fix? <laughs> Probably not. Okay, I think we need to beam some of these people up, Scotty, or something. Like that. Um, so, so you know, the California water fix uh, originally was going to involve two tunnels to bring water down, and then some public agencies were wavering on their support, and so then it was one tunnel that's going to do it, and then just the other day, uh, the Metropolitan Water District Board took a vote to, to basically finance the lion's share of the, of, the, of the funding necessary to build two tunnels. Um, and there were, there were some complaints around the place that maybe that means that, that uh, Southern California would be subsidizing uh, other beneficiaries um, of the project. Uh, I think the thought is that those beneficiaries will at some point need that water and therefore will need to, to, uh, to make their own investment. But could you, could you take us back and tell us about the tunnels project, the water fix, what it is, why it's necessary, and what the next steps are and how you see it uh, progressing. Sure, thank you, David. Uh, so uh, Metropolitan Water District, as David points out, we serve water to 19 million people here in Southern California across six counties. Uh, that's essentially one in every two Californians. I think an interesting way to look at it, that's one in every 16 Americans uh, that we're providing water to and that live here in Southern California it explains a lot about our traffic and other things. But this project is, we get our water in Southern California, a little more than half of it comes from two places, the Colorado River to the east of us and Northern California to the north of us. And one of the challenges has always been getting water from the Northern Sierras across this area called the uh, Sacramento Bay Delta. And this area is half a million acres, it's about 35, 40 miles long, and it is a maze of channels. And the original plan in the 1930s, when we built, when California built the Central Valley Project, was to build a bypass around the Delta. It was part of the state water plan in 1960. It went to the voters as a peripheral canal in 1982. We have always known this is a huge vulnerability right in the middle of the state that leaves our entire water system at risk in terms of earthquake, and now we know uh, more challenging times in terms of climate change, uh, rising sea levels. All these are complications that uh, threaten our water supply to three to four million acres of Central Valley farmland and 25 million Californians from the uh, Silicon Valley, East Bay, and the Bay Area, as well as all of Southern California. So the current concept, as put forward by it was originally started under Governor Schwarzenegger and perfected or finalized, I should say, under uh, Governor Brown, Jerry Brown, has been to build two tunnels underneath the delta with modern technology. You don't need a canal. You can do it with tunnels and bypass the delta and actually move water in a way that will enable the delta to go back to its more natural ebb and flow as a tidal marsh estuary. It's uh, intended mainly to be an environmental remediation project for the delta. And that's the concept. We did have a, um, a hiccup, or I should say a significant challenge, when a number of the agricultural agencies basically looked at it and said, we don't know that we can invest. These were mainly uh, Central Valley Project federal water contractors. They've always in the past gotten help either from Congress or the state to do this. Uh, so our board, Metropolitan, eventually decided to step up and say, we're going to finance that share uh, that would, was unfinanced and then we'll own and control that capacity in the system and we will sell or lease that back to agricultural districts as they need it or continue to use that to benefit Southern California. So it's a, it's a different approach. It wasn't one we've done before, but I, it, it, we reached a point in time where we had to make a tough decision and that was the decision of our board. So moving forward, that's what we're doing. Uh, that was the vote just, uh, I guess, a week ago. It's been a long week. Uh, and so uh, we, we are now working very closely with Carla Nemeth, who you just heard, uh, working on finalizing all those complex arrangements so that we can go start implementing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, uh, Enrique, turning to you next, you lead an organization which operates and maintains one of the world's largest wastewater collection, uh, treatment, and disposal systems. I think you have 3,000 employees at, uh, at LA uh, Sanitation. And, uh, but the entire 
structure is, is built around the thought that we're going to treat our wastewater to secondary and tertiary degrees, high degree of treatment, only to discharge that water into waterways and ultimately to the ocean. And, um, and, and we know that without wastewater recycling, uh, you know, this getting to this 50% goal and stormwater capture, getting to this 50% goal is going to be well nigh impossible. And your agency, um, working with LADWP, is going to be the linchpin for maximizing wastewater recycling, maximizing stormwater uh, capture. Um, uh, uh, but I, but, so I, I want you to give us some sense of the direction that uh, LA Sanitation is going in, the kinds of steps that are being taken in terms of wastewater recycling. Mark mentioned Hyperion, and the fact that that is where the bulk of our uh, water is going. Very difficult to pump that back up into the, into the system. Uh, but before that, I'd like you also to talk about One Water LA. I had the privilege of serving on the advisory committee of the One Water LA initiative. Um, and I just want everybody to know that it was, it was a delight to watch the professionalism and dedication of the sanitation staff and LADWP staff working together collaboratively uh, to produce a plan that's, that is just, uh, I, I believe, uh, nothing is flawless, uh, but, it, but it really is a, a, a very beneficial, worthwhile plan that's been produced. So talk a little bit about One, One Water LA, but then also talk to us, please, about how we get to this 50% and what part wastewater recycling and stormwater capture will play. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David. And in, indeed, we, uh, we and DWP are joined at the hip, uh, but I, I, I want to say that uh, uh, LASAN, uh, we have gone through an incredible cultural transformation over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, you know, we went from being definitely only a regula regulatorily based agency that would only treat and think of our wastewater and for that matter our stormwater as only uh, a resource that needed to be complied with um, a regulatory requirements and that was our mindset. Uh, we have gone through this incredible transformation uh, largely based on our Wong Water Initiative championed by Mayor Garcetti and uh, with DWP and ourselves being uh, partners in this effort that we know ha has had an effect not only with within us, within uh, the city, but even beyond and outside of the city. Uh, it, it is a powerful concept. Uh, I know that I've reflected on why we were entrenched in a certain thinking outside and beyond the regulatory drivers, and I think some of it also is driven by, by how we pay for stuff. I mean, uh, uh, folks pay for water consumption, uh, folks, ratepayers pay for wastewater treatment, and you know, by law, that's all they can pay for. One Water has changed that. Mayor Gassetti has uh, had an incredible policy impact on us thinking outside and beyond that, in hopes that uh, the regulatory world will adapt to us. And it's great to have um, uh, Laura here, because you know, uh, being able to take the One Water concept and have it be reflected even in legislative language would be great. Uh, but we have now become a producer of water. Not, we're not in competition with you, <laughs> Jeff. Mm -hmm. We, we, we want to <laughs> produce water for you as well. Yeah. But it's, it is a different mindset. I, I completely understand when Jeff and Marty, who's here from DWP, will speak about water reliability. It is a mindset we did not have in, in my culture. Because if we needed to shut down um, a treatment train, we would shut it down. Well, when you have 50 million, dollar, 50 million customers, or in DWP's case, 6 million, 5 million customers waiting for that water, expecting it to be there at any given time, all of the time, you need 100% reliability. And so that's a new concept for us that we have to integrate into our thinking at sanitation as well. Fairly new. And that means that when the client demands the water, it, it better be there at 
the highest quality. So we've welcomed that challenge. Uh, we uh, are very much now <coughs> comfortable with the idea of transforming the 400 million gallons a day, David, uh, uh, that come into our system, reclaim those and make, make, that, make it available for local supply. And whichever form, I mean, we talk about the LA River as one of the greatest natural features in the region, and it is. The kayaking season, by the way, begins <laughs> on Memorial Day, so start signing up. Uh, <laughs> the, the water in the river is reclaimed water. Yeah. What a great beneficial use of it. I mean, you know, if you have not gone kayaking in the LA River, please do so. Mark always makes sure that the quality is <laughs> it's, it's what it's supposed to be, as, as do we. But you, you, you get personally transformed as well as to what that natural resource means for the region. Stormwater, it's sort of a similar transformation, David, with how we used to think of it, not just us, but our partner agencies of getting it down to the ocean as fast and as quickly as possible, for a good reason. But we've grown our confidence level on being able to retain more of it mm -hmm. without risking the flood protection. And I think the local benefits that come from stormwater-based projects, I speak of those in terms of beauty, because they are beautiful. Whether it's a greenway, whether it's a uh, constructed wetlands as we've done in parts of LA, like in South LA, the greenways, all throughout the city uh, of recent, we've added a new layer to this great concept, the layer of biodiversity, local biodiversity. And I don't, I'm not necessarily speaking of providing a corridor for P22 to wander all throughout <laughs> the city, but certainly our, our bird uh, habitat. Think of a greenway in any one of your streets where there's stormwater capture features built into the system that you may or may not see. Oftentimes we are now making them more visible than not because they're beautiful. So there's a beautification concept that comes with it. Uh, exciting times for, for the water world for sure. All right, and maybe if we have time we can talk about you know, permeable surfaces, the, the kind of streets we're gonna have in the future where in the city where the water table isn't very high. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge our great COO at LADWP, Marty Adams. Thank you for being Marty. He deserves a round of applause. <laughs> he worked so hard for our city for many, many years. Thank you for your service, Marty. Um, Virginia, let's talk about uh, Parsons. Mm -hmm. Parsons is a household name uh, at the forefront of, of so many things in terms of uh, 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 water treatment technologies. Um, you are the chief strategy officer at Parsons and you and I were talking a little bit about P3s, about public-private partnerships. And we, we were discussing how on the energy side with respect to renewable energy, in fact we have public-private partnerships all the time now because of the, of the renewable portfolio standard and the, the mandate for utilities to, to get renewable en energy, which means that they have to enter into power purchase agreements and so on. We have not seen, although there is a fair amount of contracting out that happens with utilities, we haven't seen the, the same level of engagement of the private sector as we do on the energy side. And I wonder if you could give us your insights as to, as to well, whether that's true, um, and if so, what are the reasons for it and, um, and, and how you see the future evolving in terms of the private sector playing a greater part perhaps in, in all, of the, all of the roadways that we've been talking to in terms of reducing our, our uh, dependence on uh, imported water. Absolutely. I'm happy to provide that perspective and Thank you. I'm a huge P22 fan, by the way. <laughs> I follow him her, on social media. Um, so as I was uh, preparing for today's panel and thinking um, about, I was really captured by the word modernizing 
um, in the topic of our of our panel and I did a little bit of word association on that word and it made me think of change and innovation and digital and mobility and augmentation and disintermediation and disruption right and that's the world we're living in uh, right now. And as you think about modernizing our water supplies, my challenge to this group is you can't just think about water reliability and water resource management as you're talking about modernization. You have to think about your business practices and your governance structure also. And that's where procurement delivery mechanisms come into place, which is what, and contracting mechanisms, which is what a P3 model is. So if you just look at your resource side of the equation, you're leaving off an extremely important other part of the equation, which is governance structure and business practices. Very important. You know, uh, there's a lot of change happening in society right now. And it, you know, it starts with quantum computing, which goes to big data, which goes to Internet of Things. It's going to talk about that. And artificial intelligence and deep learning and predictive analytics. And, you know, holy heck, the robots are coming. And so it's this you know, significant amount of change. And you've seen in the private sector how that disruption has impacted the private sector. If you go back into 2001 and look at the top five companies that are publicly traded by market cap, they were all, you know, what we would call the blue chip stocks. They were oil companies and Walmart. Um, now they're all tech companies. They're all, it's, uh, let me see, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. Those are the top trading companies. And I think that we're naive if we think our water community is immune from this type of disruption. Uh, and so when you look at what's happening in water and the slow pace of change in water, uh, there's some reasons. I think, and quite frankly, I think it starts in 1215 with the Magna Carta, uh, which, <laughs> uh, as we know, codified the concept of public trust, which is a great and wonderful thing that our government holds natural resources and trust for, for the public. Um, and very kind of game changing uh, for, for water. And then um, we kind of stayed stagnant until 1883. So for 600 years, there was not a whole lot of change in the governance structure of water. And in 1883, we passed the Civil Service Act. And for those students of history, you'll know that that eliminated the spoil system and instead implemented a merit system in terms of our civil service structure, but also in our contracting methodologies. And that was the beginning of our traditional procurement process, which we affectionately know as design, bid, build. Uh, so for the last 140 plus years, we've been uh, predominantly uh, using, utilizing a procurement process called design, bid, build. Um, and I would tell you that we've gotten a little comfy and we've gotten a little uh, complacent. And what's the one thing that we've all learned over the last 20 years as we become more socially aware is that diverse teams provide greater creativity and they perform better at problem solving than homogenous teams. And at the end of the day, what diverse teams do is they innovate and they bring creativity and they bring different solutions that have more benefit to the problem you're trying to solve. And that's what a P3 is. A P3 is a diverse team that comes together collectively with resources both inside and outside the governance structure of the contracting agency to provide creativity and innovation in delivering a piece of infrastructure. Um, at the end of the day, what you get in a P3 is not just a point in time piece of concrete or whatever other solution, but what you get is creativity in your means and methods of your construction, of how you're going to manage your asset, of how you're going to finance and bring together two separate resources together. And I don't understand, well, at the end of the day, when you bring that diverse team, what you're doing is you're creating time and you're creating value, which translates into saving money. Uh, so I think it's a, a application and procurement process that needs to be and must be looked at for 
so that our governance structures and our contracting methodologies match current societal changes. Um, there are plenty of applications in other aspects that are scalable and, and modeled that can be used in water, certainly in transportation. California did the first P3 in transportation in 1933, Golden Gate Bridge, where a group of folks got together and did $200,000 worth of bridge financing so that the bridge could be built. I would tell you that that is fundamentally what Jeff's doing uh, on the water fix, bridge financing until the rest of the community can come together and fully participate uh, in the project. Certainly, power purchase agreements and um, Jason Barrett on the climate change panel, those, uh, what he was talking about, all P3 models applicable in the uh, energy sector. Um, so what is it going to take in the water sector? It's going to take a willingness to innovate, and it's going to take um, the water industry looking not only at what resources they're innovating to be able to deliver to its customers, but at the same time innovating its business practices and its business models and its governance structures. Uh, and I would tell you, you're either driving change or you're being driven by it. And right now, we are being driven by change as opposed to driving it ourselves. So I would encourage everyone, when you look at procurement models, to engage with what might be possible as opposed to what is already just is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Deepak Garg, he, uh, chairman and founder of Smart Energy Water. Uh, you've built a tremendous company. Uh, I think you. Uh, employ a couple of hundred people here in Southern California and maybe uh, uh, 250 people abroad and uh, what you do is, is you provide utilities with the tools to better manage the programs that they're that they're pursuing um, so what I wanted to get from you is is whether indeed talking about modernization now whether indeed better tools technological tools do exist for our water managers to get to where they need to go in terms of you know, uh, cutting imported water, wastewater recycling, uh, stormwater capture, uh, managing the relationship with customers, with their employees. Um, do better tools exist? Uh, are we utilizing them? And what do you see the trends in terms of all of the cloud-based technologies that are available to us now? So thank you, thank you, David, for giving us the opportunity. You know, I just want to thank first of LABC, you know, having this topic being discussed so broadly, and all the policymakers. In the morning, you know, we heard two governor and mayor talking about this as a major concern for the city, state, and the federal level. We, as a technology company, what we can do, definitely, policymakers are doing a great job, working hard on making the policy to ensure that this sustainability in the water and the energy side is being maintained the way it should be. And definitely the tools that exist, tools are being embraced by and being adopted by the, a lot of water energy utilities. And what we focus is, and thank you, you know, David, putting that, you know, what we try to do is with the P3, we are trying to do E3. And, and we're combining that E3 is educating the customer, engaging the customer, and empowering the customers. Because we feel that if we discuss all the sustainability and reliability over here, and nobody outside who's a common man doesn't understand what is the value, how they can be a part of this sustainability, how they can contribute for this reliability. And if they are not part of this ecosystem, all the great policies, all the great technology is not going to be utilized and not going to get the benefit what they want to get. So we definitely as a company, we globally are operating in 11 countries right now, definitely number one in, in, in North America, and we feel that because we want you to set the example as this, in this great country, great state, and the great city, we're able to innovate, and we can take this technology globally, because when we go out of the United States, we can see this problem of energy and the water crisis is too big. And why it is big? Because the proactiveness was not there. A lot of people didn't build the policy across. And I think that really is helping us now when we show the 7 billion people across the globe, if they can have on the same way, I know that a lot of you guys are using Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn on your phone. If you can have a utility app, which is on your mobile phone, which is communicating to you in the real time, how for a lot of talk about the water budget, 
what's your budget, border budget is, how it's being calculated, what, what you should be doing to saving to be compliant to those particular budgets, you know, and how you can save energy and water at the same time. That's our goal. We we pushing ourselves every day, and that's our passion. And we know that we're going to achieve that. We're continuing pushing that envelope to towards the policy uh, makers, to the state government and federal level. And I, I can tell you one thing is, we get always the support from the state and federal government for that. You know, definitely this is something they need to do. That's that's where is our goal is. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I wanted to throw out a, a num number of questions to, to the panel and, and try to get your feedback on it. Uh, but I think this is, and you've already been lobbied on a piece of legislation <laughs> already. <laughs> so I'm not going to lobby you on another one, um, Laura. But I, I, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this. You know, throughout the United States, we've got something like 56,000 water agencies. Mm -hmm. um, here in California, we've got thousands. I've heard anything from 3,000 to 7,000. And they go all the way from the massive, like LADWP, uh, to the minuscule, like you know, a mobile home park. Mm -hmm. And many of the smaller agencies are just not able to truly fend for themselves. And this is why we get these catastrophes around the place that we read about, you know, water being contaminated and so on and so forth. And so there's often been this talk uh, of, of perhaps having consolidation of some of these uh, water agencies. Um, and of course, there's a lot of resistance to that. And I, I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether you've given any thought to that at all. And Mark, perhaps you'd like to, to come in on this one. I don't know if Jeff or Enrique, you have any thoughts on this. Um, but what do you think? And, uh, and is this something worth thinking about for us as a state? Well, it's definitely worth think thinking about. And we've seen this, like you said, play out um, in what we call our EJ communities, our economic justice communities, some of our communities that are economically disadvantaged also happen to have some of these smaller agencies and when they have water contamination or other issues, it's, it's more difficult for them to respond to that. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in Sacramento about this. There's been recent legislation which recently came through the committee that I sit on, the Water, water Parks and Wildlife Committee. It's not water parks, it's water and parks. <laughs> and, um, and so there's been various pieces of legislation to try to remove some of the barriers when these agencies themselves want to consolidate. Sometimes they have governmental issues or charter issues that make it challenging for them to even do that if they want to. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen resistance from some of the other larger agencies to absorbing those smaller agencies because what their ratepayers have said, and I heard this recently in a nearby community, is this other agency wants to merge with us, but they've got all of this, all of these problems, and we don't have problems in our agency because you know, we're wealthier and we've done a great job and we're all set. So why would we now take on this small community just to pay them, pay for them to get out of their water contamination problems or whatever other problems they're having in their system? So they'll be resistant to taking that, that uh, burden on. So there's challenges from both ends. And sometimes, of course, there's just the resistance because you've got a board maybe a, you know, a, a part-time board that sits on that agency and they've run for that office and maybe they get a stipend and they, they're elected and they don't want to all of a sudden be unelected and just be back to being an ordinary you know, Rotary Club member or whatever. You know, they're on the board of a water agency. So um, there's all those challenges and, and so I think that there's <laughs> times where there's a place for um, the, the state to come in and take a look at these agencies and say, you are not functioning as intended, and there's a greater good to, for your, uh, the people that are getting water from you, that if you're failing to deliver them reliable, clean water, that maybe we step in and, and create those consolidations and find ways to, to do that from the state. So that's the debate that is going on right now based on what's happening across the state and, and through the drought. So, so just to jump in um, with what Laura was talking about, the governance issue is completely intractable. I mean, we have 200 plus agencies in LA County. This is work that J.R. DeShazo at the Luskin School, as well as Stephanie Pincel have been doing at UCLA to, to just show how completely crazy it is. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at the transformation that's occurred in the electricity sector. I wonder whether that transformation really could have occurred as rapidly as it has if we had the same sort of alphabet soup mess that we do on water. I think one of the reasons why we've been able to see this transformation moving into renewable energy is we didn't have this governance nightmare of everybody fighting for themselves. 
Now, um, the person next to me, you know, we've had our we've had our disagreements on a lot of things um, over the years on um, you know everything from tunnels to the like. But I think one thing that you will hear me say um, time and time again is that is that is that Met knows how to run a water agency. Um, and they do it very efficiently, and um, reliability, which is so critical to everybody, is such a huge part of it. Um, things that we just take for granted. The same thing goes for Department of Water and Power in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and that doesn't mean they're all flawless in other areas, but in that particular area. And so the things we take for granted, which is why we have a human right to water law in, in this state, um, is we're not providing the, those same sorts of benefits to everybody. And that's just not right in California. Um, and so we need to go much further on consolidation than even what's being talked about right now in the legislature. The, the sorts of, the sorts of um, uh, thresholds that are talked about, um, which are how frequently you do uh, exceed maximum contaminant levels. Well, that assumes that we actually have a good drinking water monitoring system on what's actually coming from the pipe, which we really don't. Um, we have a really good system from the standpoint of what the larger agencies like MET and DWP and the more reliable agencies do from the standpoint of providing water quality and providing that information to the public. These small water agencies, it is not that way in any way, shape, or form. But the way these things are looked at right now, maybe it'll have an impact in the Central Valley in some of the areas that right now um, you know, people don't have access to clean water, but it will not have um, the impact, desired impact in um, the inner city. Um, for these small agencies um, that, that exist right now and that are not being run very well. Um, and believe me, what Laura was talking about from the standpoint of the importance of everyone's individual fiefdoms, yeah, I'd rather be in a rotary club on some of those than on some of those water boards. But the, but the reality is it's super important to a lot of people locally. They, they believe it's a seat of power and they're not willing to give it up unless someone's going to make them give it up. Right. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think if we're going to truly have water as a human right, then this is, this, I mean, I wanted to put this problem up first because many people don't even think about it. But the very fragmentation of our water industry leads to uh, the, a huge the fact environmental that, that human right cannot be realized. Yeah. So thank you for that. I wanted to also talk about the stormwater fee um, as the next subject to throw out to the panel. And maybe Enrique, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, uh, because uh, you know, in LA County, as you said, we have 88 cities. They have mandates, as does the city of Los Angeles, under a permit issued by the Regional Water Board to reduce discharges, what is called urban runoff pollution, which is contaminated stormwater running out to the ocean. Um, but in order to comply with that law, uh, with, with, with that regulation, they have to expend monies, they have to make an investment. And, and I think while the city of Los Angeles has done a tremendous job stepping up uh, uh, to that challenge uh, and understanding that stormwater capture is both a water quantity issue and a water quality issue. Um, I think the city of Los Angeles has been, a, has been a leader in that. But many of the other 88 cities haven't been. And, and their complaint is that they don't have the money to do it. And so comes this idea. Of, of a stormwater fee, a, a countywide fee that would, that would take effect as an additional property tax, that property owners would pay this money so that we'll have the funding uh, for additional stormwater capture. And there's a campaign going on to do that. And I want to mention it because I want everybody's support for that, <laughs> for that campaign. <laughs> so that's my lobbying the audience. But can you, can you perhaps tell us more about that? Um, any, any one of you, how it's going and, uh, um, and, and, you know, how successful it's going to be. Well, I mean, I think, um, David, if, if anything, I, anything I say about this cannot and shall not be construed as campaigning, please. <laughs> education only. It's education. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can count it. You I don't have the same constraint, so <laughs> go ahead. <and> <laughs> but, but I will say that you know we, we talked about the the warm water and how stormwater is sort of being left out uh, uh, out of the utility universe, and th this concept of having 
a financial resource is probably one step closer to making stormwater a true utility, which it should. Because, um, you, you know, how do we translate the problems of the 70s in the stormwater, uh, the wastewater pollution, Santa Monica Bay, um, to, to stormwater? It was very well understood uh, for the wastewater world then, far less understood for stormwater for the common ratepayer or the common property owner or the common resident to say, is it really a problem of water quality and pollution? And it is, but because, you know, how close is anyone to it, uh, whether the seven, eight rain events we get a year, just think of how much stuff gets picked up at, by the flow as it runs down the streets, all the fugitive stuff that comes from, and I'm not pointing at any other sectors here, but you know, the transportation sector, <laughs> the, the electrical sector, sorry, Marty. <laughs> all of that gets picked up by, by the stormwater flow, which eventually goes to the LA River, Bayona Creek, Tahunga, Wash, Santa Monica Bay, Echo Park, Machado Lake, don't want to leave anybody out, so uh, Balboa Park, <laughs> <laughs> Malibu Lagoon, closer to home here. A port. That's where it all comes, and um, so it's real. But how do we translate it so that folks see that it is real and it's worth graduating stormwater into a full utility? So this initiative by the county, I think, is a step in that direction. So, so I, would, I would just add that, um, you know, the county led by um, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl as well as Supervisor Hilda Solis, um, it, it really painstakingly, it's really painful, guys, lots of meetings, lots of stakeholders to try to figure out what this measure is going to look like um, and make sure that it's equitable, disadvantaged communities are going to, you know, hopefully are going to get their fair share of the resources so that, you know, we're, we're these sorts of... Um, uh, uh, green infrastructure projects are going to be um, uh, just as proportional in those, in those areas as they are throughout the rest of the region um, to make sure there's equ equity for the cities that they're getting um, their fair share of funds to, to implement um, stormwater and local water um, capture measures on, uh, for individual cities, but also being able to do this on a regional basis. So for once, you know, David, you obviously know very well is the former chair of the, state, of the Regional Water Quality Control Board where we can actually make you know, watershed management, move it from rhetoric to reality, because we're gonna start funding on a watershed basis for regional projects. Um, and, and I think the big change, which um, Enrique alluded to in his opening remarks, is looking at stormwater as a resource, not just a burden that's causing water quality problems that are, make our beaches unsafe for people to go swimming or unsafe for aquatic life. Um, and so that investment is going to be on the ballots for everybody this November. Um, and it's, it's, we all know Proposition 218 makes this a bear to get this through, um, to get your two-thirds vote. Um, but from the standpoint of transforming the region's infrastructure so that we're dealing with our water quality problem, helping on flood control, and helping on local water supply, there is no measure that's even close to as important as that this year or in the last few years. It's that big of a deal, and hope LA County voters step up to make this happen. Right, and, and also the business community must see the benefit of that, um, especially given how important tourism is to us and how important the beaches are to tourists. Uh, having, having the stormwater free pass so that we can control the scourge of urban runoff pollution. And the benefits will, of local water supply for it, resilience, of exactly, course. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Jeff, I wanted to, to ask you, you know, we concentrated on the tunnels right. in the first question, but I also wanted to, to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, the many other things that, uh, uh, that MET is doing, and I agree with Mark that you sure do know how to run a water agency, but, um, but you know, you've also stepped up on water conservation, on helping local agencies conserve more, um, uh, you know, move to uh, producing more local water, in a way, that's kind of antithetical to your business model. And uh, because you want to, you know, you're, you're, you're providing a commodity, um, but at the same time, you're helping water agencies 
gain some independence from the commodity that you supply. Explain to us how that works with your business model. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, David. The fascinating thing. I is want to get educated here. On I, I, we're here we're Maybe here they don't do know it. how to run a business. <laughs> <laughs> we run a business. We run a utility. Our job is to be reliable 24/7. But at the same time, that reliability has un, it has always been under stress. Uh, if you look at Southern California, roughly every generation, we've gone out and gotten a new imported supply. Uh, the L.A. Owens Valley in 1900. Uh, Metropolitan Colorado River, 1930, State Water Project in 1960. 1990, we ran out of water and had to ration. We needed a new water supply. Unfortunately, from the engineering aspect, we weren't going to be allowed to go to the Mississippi River or the Great Lakes. Perhaps fortunately, from a sustainability standard, we, we couldn't do that. So what we've done since the 1990s, when we ran out of water, is really focused on building a local resilience uh, supply. Uh, we, Metropolitan sold two and a half million acre feet in 1990 to 14 million people. Today we sell 1.7 million acre feet to 19 million people. Huge success story. We have decoupled growth from water demand. And that was a huge un, uh, endeavor. And it was, primarily it's been conservation. But we've also really grown water recycling, primarily in Orange County and Riverside. And Metropolitan pays our customers to recycle water. We pay our customers to conserve. We basically have a stewardship fee. A, uh, we call it our water stewardship rate. But it's basically a public goods charge that we charge on every drop we sell. And then we redistribute that money to drive down demand and to build local supply. Uh, that's the only way we're going to remain reliable. We're not going to get more imported water. We're just trying to hang on to what we have, keep it as reliable as possible. And all our growth, all our future demand has to be met through local supply and conservation. So that's our mission, uh, to ensure that those things happen and happen well. And I, and I would just say, what a shock that, that um, you know, the transformation on the local water supply, where, where our big you know, source of local water can be is, and, and I know this is a, you know, a big issue for Metropolitan, is that there's a difference between supporting and leading. And they've been very, very supportive of local water supply. But to me, you know, now seeing firsthand before, more of an advocate sort of looking at Metropolitan for all these years is much, much different than being a director and sort of seeing how things work. And um, I see that the capacity is there for them to, frankly, lead the transformation on local water from the standpoint of making sure that we're not wasting our wastewater by dumping it into, into the ocean, but actually valuing every single precious drop. And regional reclaim could be the beginning of that. Um, obviously, um, you know, we're just at the pilot phase from the standpoint of MET supporting that. Um, it could turn into, obviously, a regional project where Hyperion could actually tap into that um, um, and, and provide water supply into that network as well. We see San Diego finally, after fighting the Clean Water Act for 30 years, <laughs> you know, um, looking at local, local water in a big way with their Pure Water Project. Um, and I just look at, at how well this agency is run and how good the engineers are, and that I think that much more leadership can come out from Met from the standpoint of leading that transformation as opposed to supporting it. Thank you. Um, Virginia, I wanted to, to go back to, your, to the public-private partnership that, that you talked about and maybe drill down a little bit more and ask you about, uh, you know, uh, performance-based contracting mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, can we talk about that a, a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because because the, there again, you know, we, we, we see these models in which, in which you know, uh, the, the, the private sector will come in and say, you know what, I'll, um, you know, I'll repair your leaks, I'll put in a new software system, and, uh, and you don't need to pay me anything. Right. I'll just get paid from the savings that I, that I generate. Right. Um, now, you know, that particular model is not going to work very well in a jurisdiction where there's maybe 5% NRW. Right. right. Um, NRW means non-revenue water. That means water that is wasted through leaks and breaks and, and so on. But it could work very well in a jurisdiction where there's 20% NRW. Right. Do you, and, it's, and it's fairly commonplace, and there have been some successes and failures abroad. But right. do you see that concept 
uh, making headway and catching on uh, here in California or, or, or in the United States? So I think there's, you know, it's easy to admire the problem and talk about you know, why it's not happening. So let me do that for just a minute and sure. then we can sure. talk about how, what can, how we can make it happen. There's really, I think, two fundamental issues why performance-based contracting and other alternative delivery mechanisms are difficult to implement in the water industry. They're much easier in, in the utility or the energy market and the transportation market. The first is to the comment earlier we were talking about, the disaggregation. In, in the water industry. Just the sheer number of agencies and the individual governance structures and the individual characteristics and the individual um, critical success factors in each of those agencies create what we in the private sector call barriers to entry. It's just hard. It's easier to go into transportation where there's only 50, you know, State Department of Transportations that you have to manage. Um, so, and, and in similar in the energy sector, fewer bar barriers to in entry. The other issue is there's a disconnect between the public sector and the private sector on the concept of risk. And, uh, you know, I spent the first half of my career in the public sector and the second half of my career in the private sector. And one of the things that I do is translate uh, between the two. And many of you have heard my stump speech on risk. Risk in the public sector means stakeholder risk. We're addressing stakeholder concerns and we're managing our stakeholder community and trying to achieve success and, and, and meet the needs and objectives of the stakeholders. In the private sector, risk means project execution and delivery risk. Very different concept. And so when the two parties come together and to talk about performance-based contracting, one is speaking Greek and the other is speaking Venetian. <laughs> right. And, and so you have to first create a relationship where you can have a conversation about risk and mutually understand what that means. That takes time. And to go to performance-based contracting, you really have to get to what is the risk, <coughs> excuse me, what is the risk that the public sector is trying to manage? And then how can the private sector help achieve uh, that mitigation? And when it, it comes down to metrics and uh, KPIs, key performance indicators. So if you can't quantify that down to where both parties can measure it and agree to it and understand it, then performance-based contracting won't take off. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is, is if we can measure something we want to improve and then we can assign a value to that, and then because I'm the private sector person and I can help you achieve that value, we can share in that savings on the, or, or in the creation of that value. That's where you get to performance-based contracting that works. Difficult to do in the water industry because those KPIs and those metrics have not, are not as easily quantified as they are in the transportation and the energy sector. Mm -hmm. Do I think we'll get there? Yes, I think we'll get there, but I think we'll move faster in transportation and energy. And um, I know there's a number of folks in the U.S. water market who are starting to uh, attend conferences and interact with their colleagues in Canada and Europe and the Middle East which are very comfortable with these types of models. And the more we can engage that knowledge transfer and bring, it's unusual for the states, we're bringing practices in from outside our country in. We're learning from the rest of the world. And I think that's how you're going to start to see performance-based um, contracting. I just saw a silhouette <laughs> appear over there and they're waving this thing with a five on it. <laughs> you know, so they're telling me that we have five minutes. So Deepak, I wanted to ask you a question and then a final question for you. Um, so, Deepak, real quick, what, what can be done more in order to inform utilities of the, of the kinds of technological advances that are available um, so, that, so, that, so that people in the utility industry can better uh, utilize them? I mean, is the message getting out or is it, or is it a situation where there is such, where people are used to doing things in a certain way and, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to get them to change? Or, or do you see, you know, the, the, the kind of 
the, the kind of, um, uh, I don't know, tools that you're able to offer. Do you see that catching on? Yeah, it's, or does more need have to be done? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think it's a willingness from the utilities for sure. You know, they want to adapt the technologies or not because definitely it used to be a concern if I take it four or five years back. But with the end to end security, cloud technology, and I think she talked about AI and everything, I think the technology can be easily deployed. It's no more five year and six year, you know, uh, pretty much projects. We have the utilities where we're able to adapt. They can adapt within three months, six months, able to achieve all the conservation goals they were looking for. And again, it's a digital. And it's a digital, and when I say digital is, if I think end of the day, the customers of the utility, which is the part of the public and, and the people who are really get impacted and see the value, I think she talked about a very good metrics. Can you quantify the value? And what we try to do is same thing. When we are going to the utilities, this is how we can quantify the benefit you get by engaging to the customer. It's not a revenue loss to you when the, somebody comes up. Actually, it's a benefit, just like everybody's talking here, is if you have that water available, energy available, now you can use it for other purposes. And what happens if you don't have it? And this is where I think when you talk about the West, I think they, they didn't plan for it, and when they didn't plan for it, they don't have it, they understand what is that value comes. Yeah. So I think for us, in last five years, the things change, the technology landscape change, and I think uh, utilities are really willing to adopt this technology. Definitely the messaging is keep going. We, we do, we go to every conference to ensure that uh, the utilities coming there are able to understand it is no more, because they, utilities are definitely, you know, they, they do a great job definitely giving the reliability and sustainability to their customers. So they are scared about, you know, if we take this technology, what's going to happen? Because we have a lot of great examples where the DARPA technology it took five years, ten years for them to not only integrate, get stable, and, and get the benefit out of that, but so they are saying, how, the, how you can do it within six months? And when we show them the, the cloud platform, the security and the, all the AI, and then at this platform can do it, they do it. They adapt it, and then it's, it's just pretty much a wildfire going on. And we see adoption across the globe. It's happening. Thank you. Thank you. So, Assembly Member Friedman, uh, Laura, mm -hmm. you know, the Los Angeles Business Council is the home of the progressive business community in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. To us, you know, wastewater recycling, stormwater capture, cleaning up the aquifer, um, uh, you know, these are not job killers. <laughs> to us, Good. these are job creators. Right. And these are, uh, and these, uh, you know, inure to the betterment of society. Um, but so much now depends on what goes on in Sacramento. I mean, a lot depends, unfortunately, on what goes on in Washington, D.C., but, but so much depends on, on what happens in Sacramento instead of in terms of setting statewide policy, which is what you're doing with the laws. That, so how can the progressive business community in Los Angeles better partner with you uh, in order to, to push forward with some of the ideas that we've heard here today on the panel? I love that question. Uh, sustainability. I thought is, you would. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sustainability is one of the main focuses of my work in Sacramento, and it's very difficult a lot of times because, um, as much as people care about the environment, and there are some groups out there that lobby for the environment, environmental issues don't nearly have the kind of firepower behind them as issues that directly affect businesses. And unfortunately, the wider business community tends to regard sustainability efforts and certainly legislative efforts that tend to be regulations, um, even if they're targets, as things that just naturally hurt business. It's just the knee-jerk reaction, not recognizing always the savings that that can offer, the opportunities, the market signals that drive technologies that businesses can take advantage of, and all of the other benefits. Not to mention just having more water for Southern Californians when we need it, it because we become more efficient. So that sets up a natural tension behind, that's always, in my experience, between environmental regulations and the business community. So it's very, very important that the business community that appreciates and values sustainability to be very, very vocal, to give some counterbalance perspective so that people 
uh, other legislators in Sacramento who maybe care more about the business interests say, well, the business community is not united. Maybe this isn't so bad because there are business communities that think that this is valuable, so I'll take a closer look as opposed to, well, if you know the California chambers oppose, it's got to just be a bad thing. And that often is the default position for a lot of my colleagues. And I've seen many good environmental bills die a bloody death on the floor of the legislature just in my year and a half. Um, because it's not enough to have CLCB and the Sierra Club be behind something. Uh, they're kind of, unfortunately for a lot of people, they're just the least important group that they face. Um, they're much more concerned about, you know, large businesses in their district, other stakeholders, California Chamber. So to have those businesses join the California Chamber and be there to be that left wing of that, to really start to, to engage um, in a bigger way even than that, that's happened is really important. And I'm very appreciative that the LA Business Council and other more enlightened business groups has come in in favor of some of the work that I and my environmentally leaning colleagues are doing. And I'd love to see that group get larger and larger and larger and become a real force to help push this valuable legislation forward. I think that the sustain, that the future of our state really depends on it, the future of our water resources, of having reliable power that's cleaner, of California being a leader in clean tech. We can be a leader maybe in water um, uh, efficiency technology. All of those things are good for our, our pocketbook. Um, so yeah. I, I, I want to thank you all for, for doing that. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts on anything we haven't covered? David, can I add one, one statement? Sure. You know? We have I, about a minute, though. Oh, we? thank you. I, I just want you know, I, I know that we are talking about this great topic of a sustainability, reliability. I think this is my small request to everybody when you leave and you all go home. Just think about a day without energy and water. Can we live in that life with these mobile phones and advanced technology? We know that we can't. So please, guys, you know, I think Laura is saying that she needs support, policymakers need a support private sector, public sector, all need support from the public. To, and we, as a, as a technology company, we need that support. People are more looking towards the utilities. These are the utilities are providing us the most valuable asset every day. And, and I know that, you know, everybody in this room will care about all these great tools on the mobile phones, Snapchats, and, and the Instagrams, and good guys, they, they all are running just because of there's the power, there's the water because all these technology use at the back. So please guys, make sure support definitely these policy makers in private sector. And definitely if they, they keep working hard as they're working, we'll be definitely keep providing the technology to you guys. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. So it's 3.15 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good job, David. <laughs> was this a wonderful panel or what? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for the final time today, your MC, Evan Halper. Thank you, uh, and thank you to the wonderful panelists, and thank you all for coming today to the Los Angeles Business Council's 12th Annual Sustainability Summit. It was a deeply interesting day and an inspiring day. We heard about innovative technologies, we heard about regional partnerships. We got insight into how utilities and businesses are paving the way toward achieving our climate targets, and we just heard about the future of water. Please join me in thanking our speakers, panelists, co-hosts, and all our sponsors for today's event. And I just want to let you know, a recording of the summit will be available on the LABC website. Also, please continue using hashtag LABC Summit 18 for social media posts about the event. And thank you to Mary Leslie and her team for putting together this timely convening of West Coast climate leaders. We look forward to seeing you all here next year. Thanks.